Ms. Uh, Mayor Ron Paul calling the meeting to order. I'd first like to recognize that, uh, that we meet on the traditional unceded territory of the Latako Dene Nation. I believe that we have Councillor Goulet joining us online. Yes, I see his smiling face over there. That is indeed a good sign. Uh, now I'm looking for a resolution to approve the agenda. Now there are a couple of um, amendments. There's a late item K8, snow contractors liability insurance, and that'll be going to Director Bolton. And also uh, there is an addition to, um, it's not really an agenda item, but it is a letter that didn't print. And it is, uh, I don't have a page number on it, but it's a letter from Rona Building Supplies that's inserted into your agenda and it is properly printed. Okay, so I need now uh, an, a, mo a motion to adopt the agenda as amended. Uh, move, move by, uh, all <laughs> move by Councillor Runge, I don't know why, I've, and uh, seconded by Councillor McKelvey. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed, carried. I'm sorry, but I'm flashing back to my early days by calling some of my city councillor colleagues by alderman. So I, I apologize for that. I don't. I don't know what's going on. Um, so now we need a motion to adopt the regular minute, minutes of November 22. Please. Uh, moved Alderman, <laughs> I know where I'm getting this from. Uh, moved Councillor uh, Scott Elliott, seconded Councillor Vick. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Now we will go to presentations and we have, well, no, pardon me, we don't have any presentations, we have delegations. And the first delegation is um, from, um, the LM Engineering, and we have Ashley Tandy, Community Planner, Megan Hickey, Community Planner, and Terry Feldstrom, Professional Engineer. And I'm, I don't know if, if Terry's in the room or is he, is t oh, you're Terry. On Zoom. Okay, I, I don't see a smiling face on Zoom, but I suppose when it's time to talk, um, I'll see the smiling can see, face. Can you, can you see me now? I've, I've got it. Thank you very much. That, I love that technology. Don't don't move. <laughs> so I would now we're we're going to just switch the order of the of the present or of the delegation. We're first going to hear from L and M Engineering regarding the uh, the Davy Street uh, project. So the floor is yours, please. Can you, can we hear it? Okay, we're good, all right. Okay, good evening, uh, Mayor and members of Council. My name is Ashley Thandy, and this is my colleague, Megan Hickey, and we are community planners from l and Engineering that will be presenting the revitalization plans to you tonight. Um, and as Mayor Paul has mentioned, uh, the president of our firm, Mr. Terry Feldstrom, is joining us via Zoom, and he's available to answer any technical-related questions um, after the Davie Street presentation. So it is with distinct pleasure that we are presenting the Davie Street Revite Plan to you this evening. Both of the revitalization plans are exciting long-range documents that will provide certainty for council, citizens, and developers regarding the future development of these important areas of our community. Both plans are also very comprehensive, so we're going to be limiting our remarks to showcasing the highlights of both of these plans, as well as the opportunities the creation of the Revite Plans presents for your community. The creation of both plans also represents a collaboration between a, a variety of key people. City of Quinnell staff were instrumental in assisting l and to complete this planning process. We would like to thank Melissa Pritchard, City Planner, and Tanya Turner, Director of Development Services, for their support in the creation of the plans. And a thank you to Laura Long, Executive Assistant, and Tian Fung, Communications Coordinator, coordinator sorry, who were crucial in helping us with the community consultation component of this project. Finally, we would like to thank the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure who assisted us with the Davy Street reconfiguration with respect to Carson Ave and Marsh Drive, as well as a huge thank you to all of the residents who spent time participating and providing input into this process.
Hi, as Ashley mentioned, my name is Megan, and I had the pleasure of working with Ashley to produce these two revitalization plans for the city of Quinnell. To quickly summarize our presentation today, we are going to give an overview of the Davie Street plan area and the planning process that led us through the project, start to finish. Next, we will give an overview of the revitalization plan itself and go into detail on these four sections the streetscape and public realm, movement and parking, built form, and implementation. Finally, we will finish the presentation with some closing remarks and respond to any questions. So the plan area is located downtown, abutting Carson Avenue and Legion Drive, with two core blocks on Kinchin Street and Davie Street. The focus of this plan is revitalization through road realignment and through the creation of attractive, convenient, and pedestrian-friendly spaces that connect the plan area to the Johnson subdivision and downtown core. So because of this, this plan is primarily more of a design initiative rather than your typical area or policy document. The plan area contains a mix of uses and amenities that you can see here on this image, including a brewery, motel, restaurant, martial arts school, as well as government and emergency service buildings. While this area has some ingredients that make for a successful part of a downtown core, it appears to be underserved in some key areas. Overall, it is apparent that residential and retail land uses are lacking in the area. Housing is a necessary tool to ensure a successful long-term revitalization strategy for the plan area as a lack of the number of people living within the plan area or the downtown core constrain the type of retail and commercial developments that would be considered viable. So we're just going to quickly go over a little bit of the planning process kind of from start to finish. Um, so phase one, the intent of this step and this phase was to develop an in-depth understanding of where the plan area has been, where it's now currently, and where it should go in the future. We took a look at the city's current policy and regulatory framework, it had a kickoff meeting with city staff, and then conducted a site visit to see the physical condition of the plan area. Then we moved on to phase two, which is the engaged portion. The objective of this phase was to focus on community engagement prior to initiating the concept design and the actual development of the plan. We wanted to know how residents and stakeholders felt the area should look and feel in the future. The result of this step really helped us to develop a range of key guiding principles, which we're gonna speak a little bit more about in detail in the next few slides. Phase three was the creation of the plan itself. We created a structured draft concept design that we went back and forth with the city staff and Ministry of Transportation on, and then the subsequent plan document was created. Phase four was our review and refine stage. So the draft document was first provided, as I mentioned, to city staff, and then once it was approved for dispersal, a second engagement period was held to share the draft plan with stakeholders and residents. Uh, this provided an opportunity for the community to see their vision on digital paper for further refinement and ultimately helped us to ensure a quality finalized product that appropriately represents the community. And then phase five is where we're at today, our final presentation for Mayor and Council. Listening and learning from the experience of residents and stakeholders is a core component in defining a direction forward and creating a plan that residents are proud um, to take ownership of. The screen here lists a number of engagement and cons consultation activities that were ongoing throughout the lifespan of the project where we heard from the community to learn their needs and a vision for the future of this area. A project webpage was created specifically for this project which allowed for the public to fill out an online survey, share their ideas on an ideas board, use an interactive map to recommend locations where development should occur and post questions. The webpage also allowed for images of the plan to be shared and a timeline to show what stage of the project we are at. With the location of the plan area and the idea of reconfiguring a road, it was essential to have early and ongoing engagement with the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure. The City of Quinnell also released several social media advertisements and email blasts to remind and encourage the community to provide their ideas and feedback. 
Finally, stakeholders were engaged with and heard from in one-on-one -on -one conversations over the phone as well as a stakeholder workshop with business and property owners from the plan area. The right side of the screen here shows a summary of some data that was collected through the Let's Connect webpage. So we had a total of 74 completed online surveys, 988 total web page visits, and 334 document downloads from the web page itself. So after doing our community inventory, our first round of consultation and taking into consideration the vision outlined in the OCP for the area, we were able to come up with some key guiding principles. So the first one was looking at attracting new investment into the plan area. So one of the main uh, objectives of the revitalization plan was to create the appropriate conditions and physical environment to make the area more attractive for investment. Um, so the next few guiding principles really build on top of that. We've also provided some development incentive recommendations within the implementation matrix of the plan that help facilitate redevelopment of existing thanks, Megan, privately owned sites. So the second guiding principle was looking into promoting public realm design and excellence. So public realm is just a fancy planning word, meaning anything that um, essentially is kind of public property. So open spaces, road right of ways, roads, sidewalks. Um, we just like to be fancy in planning and call it public realm. This was mentioned um, when we talked about attracting new investment. Um, the overall enhancement of the plan area is perhaps the most critical influence on investment potential. This involves aesthetic improvements and urban design elements as well as rebalancing that transportation system. The end goal is rebranding the plan area as a desirable destination for residential and commercial investment. So new buildings and or the renovation of existing buildings um, as well as that public realm in general should really try and pursue the highest quality design possible and inspire an authentic sense of place. Um, we really just want to make sure that it, it draws people in and keeps people in the area um, wanting to stay. The third guiding principle was looking at providing a balanced transportation system. So a new fully connected and appropriately scaled transportation network is proposed within the plan area that looks at providing a good balance between vehicular traffic, cyclists and pedestrians in order to create a safe, high quality public realm for all users. When redesigning traffic movements in the area, uh, we looked at reducing the emphasis on vehicle movement while in improving that pedestrian environment through more sidewalk connections and wider sidewalk widths. The final guiding principle was looking at fostering linkages to surrounding areas. So while the plan is located, plan area is located in the downtown core, it's slightly disconnected from important areas of the city. The final guiding principle is ensuring that the plan area is not only integrated within the downtown core, but also to surrounding neighborhoods and amenities on the fringes of the plan area. So here's the overall conceptual revitalization plan design for the Davy Street area. The following points are a summary of the recommendations for the plan area. So first here we have a one-way conversion of Davy Street, um, which, which includes a bike lane. Next, we have the addition of 28 new angled parking stalls and six new parallel parking stalls along Davy Street. As well for parking is the addition of eight parallel parking stalls along Kin Kinchant Street. Number four, here we have um, streetscape improvements along Davy Street, um, which actually will go into more detail on the next slide. Next, we have the removal of the existing median at the south end of Davy Street to create a more defined street access. Number six, we have the removal of, or sorry, number six shows the addition of new pedestrian sidewalks in a few locations. And seven, we have a few new proposed green spaces and universal, universally accessible public seating areas. Eight here is um, the formalization of parking stalls located along Vaughn Street. And finally, number nine shows the um, enlarged traffic island at the north end of Davy Street, 
um, which is to help with the protection um, from vehicles when p crossing the street as a pedestrian. So one, of, oops, so one of the larger recommendations coming out of the uh, revitalization plan is the undertaking of full streetscape improvements along Davy Street. The one-way conversion of this street afforded us the ability to widen the sidewalk on one side of Davy Street while expanding this current sidewalk through a new proposed green space area to connect it to the existing sidewalk on Kinchin Street, which we'll talk about a little bit more in the next slide. The plan looks at an approach on street furniture recommending the typical bench seating, um, bicycle rings, hanging baskets and new banners which is nothing new to the municipality but as we know these simple things really create a big impact um, in certain areas. Um, we also had recommended that um, the plan looked into paved parking surfaces, specifically indicating that while poured in place concrete should comprise the majority of that walking surface. It can be augmented with textured paving, a textured paving bank along the less traveled portion of the sidewalk. So looking at potentially using granite, clay brick, or concrete unit paving um, are all possible options. Taking all this into consideration into the context of winter cities as well to see what's currently working in um, Quinell and currently isn't with regards to sidewalk material. In addition, the streetscape improvements um, also look into murals to cover up blank walls within the plan area. When well done, we know that public art becomes an identifiable point in the urban environment, contributing to a stronger sense of place. So one thing that came through the public consultation was the need for more open space in the plan area that had seating options for residents and visitors. Is it, all, it is also understood that vehicles may park in this area, which is why we have proposed bollards to be placed for protection and to prevent vehicles from driving onto new open space areas. Next is the planting of trees such as Swedish columnar aspen, which is shown here on this image, um, to help with screening the highway from pedestrian areas. And then next here we have... What? Oh, next here we have some examples of outdoor seating for the green space and pedestrian areas. Um, it is also important to consider and ensure that the outdoor furniture is university, universally accessible for all. So the redevelopment of Davy Street will provide a significant step towards the overall improvement of the image and character of the plan area. This cross section in the slide deck um, above illustrates on-street parking on both sides of Davy Street that supports local businesses and helps to separate pedestrians from moving traffic. The traffic lane width is the standard for single lane street, which will also support traffic calming by discouraging higher traffic speeds, and it will help to create that pedestrian oriented and business friendly environment along Davy Street. So we just wanted to kind of show the cross section to see what we've kind of seen what it looks like from, the, from an eye view, so to kind of open it up to show a little bit to see what it looks like from this kind of angle. And then our next slide, it's a little bit technical. We threw this one in for Terry's engineering brain, but um, it, we just kind of wanted to show the truck turning template that we used in consideration when we looked at the road reconfiguration. So one of the really large aspects of this plan was ensuring that the anchor in this area, Barkerville Brewing, was going to be serviced accordingly and appropriately. Um, we did have general discussions with them about the type of loading um, vehicles that come in to their space and how much room they would technically need. So they, they would use anything from a small little loading vehicle to a big, we call it WB02, I might have butchered that, sorry Terry, but it's kind of a big semi-truck. So we had to look and see if those semi-truck movements could actually work with the one-way configuration that we had done. Um, and so it's a technical drawing, but we did want to put this up there for the purposes of showing that there was some consideration that had to go into the reconfiguration of the road. Um, and why we, Davy, was, Davy Street was recommended to be a one-way and why the parking stalls are proposed to be where they are. And this is also included in the plan as an appendix. So the last um, kind of revitalization uh, plan 
a strategy that we're going to talk about before we go into the implementation matrix. Oh, we, actually, we have a few more slides. But we wanted to talk about crime and safety in the area because that was something that came up quite a bit through the public consultation and a little bit through the stakeholder. Um, and while the depth and the root of that crime and safety is a little bit beyond the scope of planning. There's a tool called crime prevention through environmental design that we can utilize in the planning realm to help ensure that the urban design of the area is helping to reduce um, aspects of crime. So crime prevention through environmental design is a strategy used to mitigate opportunities for criminals and unwelcomed behavior. It's based on the idea that it is possible to use a design of urban environment to lessen or prevent the incidence of crime against people and properties. At its core, the theory really accepts that people take behavioral cues from their environment. So therefore, it is possible to influence behavior through the design and management of the built environment. So how do we implement this, this SEPTED principle into the plan area? Through mixed-use buildings that encourage natural surveillance, we call it eyes on the street. So having those residential units incorporated into the plan area ensures that people are staying within the plan area at all hours of the day. It's not just during business hours and then the plan area clears out and it's empty. It's that people are physically living there and they have eyes on the street at all times. We implement it through um, encouraging storefronts to be transparent within the plan area so that there's clear sight lines from inside the buildings to open public spaces such as sidewalks. As well as by developing, we call them activity generators, such as open spaces, which will allow people to casually observe their surrounding environment. So we have people coming in, enjoying these open spaces in the plan area. If something bad is happening, there's going to be eyes on it, and it's less likely to happen because there's people visiting and more eyes around. And finally, by providing the opportunity for the integration of public art and murals on buildings, either as part of the physical building or its public realm, so that there's less opportunity for vandalism and graffiti. Um, SEPTED discourages blank walls because it does encourage graffiti. So we've seen in other municipalities and even in Prince George, if there's murals or more windows or anything on walls that break that um, facade up, there's less likelihood of vandalism or graffiti. Um, one thing, where is it? Oh, the map, this map here has the locations for the development opportunities. Um, they're highlighted in this red kind of color. Some of the potential uses for these sites are listed here on the screen and include mixed use commercial and residential buildings, commercial uses such as cafes, retail shops, or a pub, a new hotel or motel, an arts and cultural facility. Um, and maybe even a new distillery, urban cidery, or micro distillery for whiskey. Uh, so finally, we wanted to provide kind of a snapshot of the implementation matrix and strategy that's provided at the end of the document. Um, it's quite comprehensive, so we didn't want to put everything in the um, slide deck, but we did just want to show kind of the layout of what the implementation strategy looks like, because we're looking at a really long-range planning document, and there's ways to um, implement some of the recommendations in short and medium and long-term um, time frames. So the snapshot that we've shown is just uh, some of the incentives that we had talked about earlier, um, such as amending the city's uh, multi-unit housing incentives program to encompass the entirety of the plan area. Right now, I think it just stops right at the cusp of the plan area, but bringing that border down just a little bit would help to incentivize more multifamily housing um, if it's mixed use in the area to kind of go off of that SEPTED principle that we had previously talked about. Um, and then we talked about um, um, implementing more murals. There's the possibility of doing a mural program. Um, and then one thing that is just because I think there's some things that happen already in Quinell, but a parklets program. So a parklet is just the utilization of a few parking stalls in front of a business to have a patio um, in place over the summertime. Again, just encouraging people to be outside um, and into the plan area. And then we provided potential funding resources and then um, potential groups and key personnel just and to ensure that the onus isn't entirely on the city to implement 
um, some of the recommendations, but that it's a group effort. So that is the wrap up of our first presentation. Thank you for your time and for listening in on this one. Um, we are available to take any questions, comments on this plan before we pop on to the next one. Well, thank you very much. That was very well done. Now I'm going to open up the floor for council comments and questions. Not all at once. Councillor Runge. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a question with regards to your engagement. When, when we were talking about the seven initial stakeholders that you were talking about, were those the, did they belong to each of the buildings there or were, were some of the buildings not represented? Okay, sorry, I was just going to try moving back here. I guess we can do an overview. Um, they were mostly of all of them. Unfortunately, the only building that wasn't able to participate was the one, I think it was a motel site. Um, they were engaged. They just didn't have a chance to participate in that stakeholder. But otherwise, um, all of the property owners were able to, and business owners were able to participate in that workshop. And perfect. And, and the other question that I ask every presentation, I think, is uh, on the public engagement, did we parse out how many people were from our community versus, because it was an online uh, survey, were they all Quinnell or regional district residents or did we get some people from uh, the city or outside communities filling those ones in also just for numbers? That's a very good question. Um, I know that we have that data. Um, there was a question in the survey whether or not you're a resident of Quinnell, and I'm fairly certain, actually, sorry, if you don't mind, I'm just gonna look into my thing here to make sure I'm fairly certain mostly everybody that participated was a resident of Quinnell. Um, we specifically asked that question just to kind of filter to make, not to make sure that it's just residents of Quinnell, but just so we kind of have an understanding of the reach that we're getting for participation. So let me just look and see if we have that in here. If we don't, I can for sure um, send that your way. I think we have the data from the city, so. Sorry, it's okay if, there, if most of them were from there, then that's fine. I just wanna make sure that we are getting a fair representation from the city. And I guess my final question is, was there any kind of discussion, because currently the way I see this plan, it's, I love this plan, by the way, it's fabulous, but it, it benefits the left side of our, uh, the left side a little bit more. And what the plan with its intent would require, it looks like the right side of Davie Street businesses to re and re. You know, to build them into uh, you know microbreweries and different houses and different shops. Currently, that street, when you look on that side of the street, is a good candidate for murals and things like that. But it, it needs some major development. So I'm just I'm just wondering if those owners of those properties would be interested in doing that, or if that discussion had ever happened as we talked, because as the owners, you know, because there's lots of stuff there. You're asking, sorry, uh, uh, Council Runge, if uh, conversations have been had with the owners on uh, the uh, the uh, right side of the where the Grace Inn is, etc. Um, if uh, if discussions with them about redevelopment have happened, yeah. is that? because this is a multi-million dollar uh, ask of the city, but without the intent to also develop the right side of the street, it would leave some things undone. Exactly, and as, as the presenters uh, 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 highlighted, the whole intent is to encourage those conversations further. Honestly, in the in the 15 years I've been here, I've had a conversation with almost every property owner about redevelopment of some time at some point, um, and definitely in this in the, in the last few years, definitely a number of conversations with different property owners in that area um, about redevelopment. Um, following a uh, 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 you know some more. Uh, uh, maybe appetite on this from council, it would be easier to go to count, to those property owners and say, hey, we're looking at these, how would you like to get to get uh, on board? Anyone else? Councillor Vick. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Thank you. It was, this could be a very transformative plan for this specific part of our city. I guess what I'd like to to know or get a feeling of is sort of what's next in terms of execution. Um, 
uh, and obviously that, that lends into a discussion on what things cost to do some of these things. So I guess I'd like to know what's next in terms of uh, strategic planning and, and integrating some of these concepts into a plan where we can start to execute. And then I also, after that, if I could, I have another question about the parklet uh, concept with um, seating in parking stalls. Thank you, uh, Councillor uh, Vic. Um, really what's first is Council's endorsement of the plan. We need to make sure that this is something that Council's interested. Um, definitely after that, this is not going to be something that we plan over over uh, and, and, and complete all these actions within the next year or two, three years. This is a long-term planning document um, where we will bring back to strategic planning, bring back to budgeting in the future, following out of strategic planning, um, different uh, uh, items that we would recommend initiating uh, on a, on a uh, uh, on a prioritized basis. And as well, working with and talking with developers about also contributing to some of these items. Thank you, Director. Anyone else? I, I've got a couple of questions. Um, I noticed that with the Dave, or pardon me, with the um, North Fraser Drive project, uh, there were actual physical mail outs um, that were done I guess with the residents and the businesses within the the area. But I don't see that with regard to the Davy Street project. And I'm wondering if, if there was a, a hand delivered or a mailed survey that went to each of the properties. Thank you, Mayor Paul. That's a really good question. So um, the mail outs that were done in the North Fraser Drive landing area were specifically to the residences that live in that area. Um, just understanding that there might have been some restraints with regards to access to the internet to do the physical surveys. Um, so we want, and also acknowledging that there are quite a few people of the disadvantaged populations that reside in that specific area. So doing specific mail outs of a hard copy of that survey was just a way for us to ensure that the survey was accessible to everybody in that specific area. Um, for the Davy Street, we didn't have any residences that resided within the plan area. Um, so we were able to connect with the business and property owners either via phone or email um, and were able to direct them to the website and then subsequently do an online workshop with most of them. Okay, so further, <clears throat> further to that then, every um, owner slash um, occupier slash renter, um, if it was a commercial renter, they were all contacted. Okay, thank you. Um, on, uh, on, the op on the new open space slash seating area, there's a reference to Marsh Drive. I, I think that must be an error because, um, or, or maybe can you explain um, how the screening from Marsh Drive comes into that picture. Sorry, I think it's it's called Marsh Drive and it's also called, what is that street? Sorry, Tanya, putting you on the spot. I'm sorry, that's the Moffitt Bridge Approach. Moffitt Bridge Approach, um, and then also the ministry identifies it as Marsh Drive um, on their website as well, so I apologize. Okay, um, no it's, problem. It's got a few names rolling around on there, so. <laughs> Just so that you know that I'm reading it with a fine tooth, with a magnifying glass. Um, but on that, um, were all of the um, businesses on Davy Street uh, on side in favor of the one-way street configuration? Because I, the, when, it, when I look at the street configuration, um, the businesses, though I guess it's, there's one business, which is the sewing center, uh, wouldn't be accessible southbound on Davy. that uh, someone that wanted to go to that business would have to circle around uh, completely down to the police station and around and back up. Are they aware of that? Um, Terry, just for you, the sewing center is on the corner by point seven there. Um, on the, yeah, down towards the south. Um, so when we were doing the stakeholder workshops, one of the actual things that came out of that workshop was the one-way conversion um, of Davy Street and the consensus between all of the stakeholders that this is something that they wanted to see. Um, the sewing center was aware that the configuration would mean that people would go around, but we also had conversations about the potential redevelopment of their property and what that use might look like in the future, and they were very open and receptive to doing something a little bit different. Um, so 
for them, it was wanting more parking in the area. Um, I think that was a big one, and I think the understanding that the one-way conversion of Davie Street was kind of the only way to do that. Um, so they were all very um, much so on board of that one-way conversion, and they were also all very appreciative of the city of Quinnell for um, taking a step towards um, this initiative. They were all very excited. Good, thank you. I'm happy to hear that. And uh, one, one other one. Um, I don't see any mention in here of how a proposed Highway 97 interconnector would or could positively impact this area, uh, particularly with regard to the Carson Avenue Front Street um, link. Could you comment on that, please? If you don't mind, I'm going to pass it over to Tanya for um, just a comment on that. Uh, thank you. Um, definitely we had discussions with, with the uh, consultant about uh, the interconnector and the possibilities of it going forward. Um, of course, um, uh, given that there's no nothing in a budget at this point or, or we don't have a, a, a knowledge of, of when that might happen, you need to plan for it without it, but um, acknowledging that there might be additional bonuses in the future. Definitely we talked about having, you know, the, the ability to increase, uh, again, the pedestrian aspect and the uh, uh, um, a cycling aspect of, of Carson, et cetera, and, 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 and further improving those connections if, if that should happen. Yeah, for, for me, I, I think that the planning should proceed with the optimistic view that we are going to get that connector and that obviously uh, Carson Avenue would be a big part of that, that whole picture. And finally, um, how soon would it be when we could get cost estimates for the short, the medium, and the long-term components of this project? I'm assuming that we'll have its discussion moving forward at strategic planning and give, we'll give that direction and we'll start working with uh, uh, engineering firms on that. Perfect, thank you. Um, oh, Councillor Rudenberg. Thank you. Um, as one councillor has already said, I think he used the word transformative, and, and it really is. And when you look at the um, parking spaces, that's that issue that always plagues anything. It's like all of a sudden we're actually giving more parking spaces. We're not taking them away. In my mind's eye, like I don't see the numbers being less here. They're actually going to be more. And, you know, it, it creates this uh, another hub for our community to gather, right? So we have these wonderful pieces downtown, but this is at that, you know, the heel of the downtown, and there's not been that opportunity to gather except at, you know, at the, the Barkerville Brewery. So now you're going to have this incredible space. And I think even, you know, with all the parking that's there, businesses like the sewing center are going to go, ha, huh, you know, there, there are opportunities there for people to, to stop and come in and I think you know given that you start to create these inviting hubs for for um, people that um, they're gonna go huh you know I don't want to take the alternate truck route I want to keep I just want to kind of come out and go visit this particular area sit have lunch have a beer go shopping whatever so it's about creating um, creating spaces where people want to actually come to and not just drive through so I really like that and the fact that you know you know we've got this here and we'll potentially take it to strategic planning and decide you know how we're going to move forward with this then you know we then we have the ability to look at funding sources because we know that there are all kinds of interesting opportunities when we talk about this kind of planning in communities so um, transformative was a very good word and I would use that again um, I think uh, I look forward to this discussion further on thank you uh, thank you, Councillor Rudenberg. Now, I'm going to go to Director Turner. I don't see um, a recommendation here. Are we looking, are you looking for some sort of a council resolution on this to say that, yes, uh, we're, we're, we're on board and we're prepared to move ahead with you? Thank you. This, the presentation was just more for receipt uh, uh, for, uh, from Council. Um, we will discuss uh, options, but going forward, like you say, when we bring you back details about how we can phase it and how we can cost it. Okay, well, thank you for that. I guess we're ready then to move on to the North Fraser Drive uh, Landing Revitalization Plan. We've got to shorten that title somehow. But uh, ladies, it's, uh, the floor is yours again.
Okay. So we're gonna try and get through this one and get you guys back on, on time here for your agenda. So our final uh, presentation is for the North Fraser Drive landing area in West Quinnell. While the area is rich with history and has some great potential, it has unfortunately experienced challenges over the years, in part due to development limitations of the area being in the floodplain. So one of the main objectives of this plan was to take a look at how to provide realistic development policies for developing in the floodplain in order to bring investment back into this area of town so that can, it can become a vibrant neighborhood. So we started to develop this revitalization plan through the lens of an action plan and even formatted it a bit different than most long-range policy documents. Typical long-range plans will begin with the background information, the plan purpose, the overview of the plan area, land use analysis, etc. However, this plan begins with the actions necessary to attain the goals and visions of creating a vibrant, inclusive, and culturally rich mixed-use area. Because to us, the plan that come, a plan that comes um, without action is merely just a dream and we wanted this plan to be practical as well as achievable. Um, so similar um, to the discussion points of the Davy Street uh, plan, this screen here shows just a summary of our presentation. Um, so we'll first provide an overview of the plan itself and then go into detail um, regarding managing the flood hazard, development incentives, design guidelines specific to the area, enhancements to the public realm, and implementation, and then again, closing remarks and a question period. Uh, so we just wanted to provide a quick overview of what the plan area um, looks like. So the boundary extends um, Marsh Drive slash Moffitt approach <laughs> um, up north past Fuller Avenue. It consists of about 201 parcels. It's a mix of commercial, civic, assembly, institutional, and residential land uses. Um, so just again to quickly reiterate, the plan focus was to identify ways to safely develop in the floodplain, to encourage investment back in the area, improve the overall quality of, for residents, um, look at fostering a distinct and unique neighborhood character and identity through form and character um, recommendations and then focusing on realistic implementation measures. So again here you see a timeline of our phases um, very similar to the Davy Street project. Um, yeah, we won't go uh, but to stay on time. Right? Yeah, to stay on time we're just going to keep on uh, trucking through this one. Um, yeah, so community, community consultation again, there is a project web page created with an online survey, a share your ideas section, as well as an interactive map and a place to ask questions. Um, as discussed, the printed copies um, of the survey were mailed to approximately 157 residents in the area. Um, the city also did their press releases um, on social media as well as email blasts. Uh, and then we had stakeholder discussions over the phone for this area. And then on this right side, you'll see the stats here. So we had 40 online surveys completed, 685 web page visits, and 229 document downloads from the web page. So next we're just going to go over some of the implementation measures that are outlined within the plan. The first is looking at managing uh, the flood hazard. So one of the objectives was to identify ways to safely develop in the floodplain and minimize the risks and costs associated with flooding. Um, so we wanted to provide guidelines for non-structural flood, flood mitigation design. And that just means that we're looking at setting policy for building in the floodplain and constructing flood resilient buildings. So that's what non-structural flood Flood mitigation is structural flood mitigation is looking at um, dams, dikes, tiger dams, those types of things. There's already extensive reporting that's been done for the city of Quinnell on that. We wanted to fill in the gap on doing the non structural, the construction, the building side of things. Um, and then just a quick note on the flood levels in the area. 
So we have a section um, of regarding flood resilient design policy with the intention that um, the recommendations of the policy could be implemented within the official community plans, floodplain development, um, development permit area, or even within building permit guidelines for staff to utilize as kind of a baseline for when people want to develop in the floodplain. So we looked at considering, giving consideration to amend the maximum height of the current C-2A North Fraser Drive um, local commercial zone for residential uses. Um, development in the floodplain encourages um, habitable spaces to be on that second floor. So looking at it through the lens of a developer, if they're able to get an additional, right now it's four stories is the maximum. So being able to get even an additional five stories, it gives you four stories of um, developable space that could, they could potentially utilize with that main floor being utilized for storage or um, parking. We also um, encourage future development to look at plenty of vegetation to hope help slow down surface flooding and soil erosion. So the plan document itself looks at um, implementing dogwood, things like dogwood species, thing, uh, vegetation that really soaks up that water. Um, and then looking at new buildings, encouraging engineered foundation structures that incorporates openings such as flood vents to reduce structural damage from flooding. So ensuring that water can come in, but it can also come out easily and it doesn't stay contained within that building, creating more risk. Then uh, recommending that the renovation of existing buildings or structures um, that do not include addition consider, we call it wet flood proofing, so raising those electrical sockets above um, onto that habitable floor or even if it's lower on that first floor, raising them above if possible, using building materials that are more water resistant and um, again incorporation of openings within basements such as flood vents. And then the final kind of main design policy and I guess not really design policy, but the final kind of recommendation is looking at removing those derelict buildings and hazardous conditions that have been found to uh, exist within the plan area as they do pose a large flood hazard risk. Um, they also just pose a large risk to the overall form and character of the area. So um, looking at cleaning up those properties through the nuisance bylaw would also in turn help to encourage developers to invest in the area because it's cleaned up a little bit. They don't have those buildings next door that have 500 cars in the um, parking lot or whatever like that. So under each of our implementations within the plan, we have a large matrix at the end, but we also inserted um, a really brief recommended action, key steps, key personnel and funding opportunities, just to quickly comprehend, um, again, the actions required to implement those design policies that we have in the plan. And then further, we looked into potential development incentives. So this is, not the recommendation that all of these need to be implemented or even one, but just the consideration for staff and council to look at different tools to utilize when trying to encourage um, investment within a floodplain area. So the first, um, we had mentioned this one in the Davie Street, but also same for this one, looking at amending the existing multi-unit housing incentive program boundary to encompass the entire North Fraser Drive plan, land, um, North Fraser Drive landing plan area, sorry. So right now it does encompass a portion, but being able to extend that boundary up a little bit would help to encourage um, the incentive to tr try and provide a little bit more multifamily housing in the area. Um, considering a potential property tax abatement, um, it could be called a floodplain development property tax abatement program, only specific to the plan area to help offset developer or homeowner costs associated with developing um, residential mixed use and commercial uses. Looking at a density um, bonusing program, so consideration could be given to a modest density bonusing program um, contributions for residential development in the plan area only on a case by case basis. And the program purpose would kind of be to look into increasing green space and park areas within the floodplain while providing direct incentives for developers to realize a higher profit on residential builds. So it's kind of a win-win for everyone. You're increasing your permeable surfaces 
areas within the plan area while allowing developers a little bit more gross floor area, a little bit more density if they provide some extra green space. And finally, last one was looking into the waiver of building permit fees. Um, so in order to encourage developers and residents to apply for building permits for new builds or renovation to existing properties, looking at considering um, waiving build, building permit fees for just a certain period of time, it could be two years, five years, more or less than that. It would just help and aid in creating kind of a buzz for development in the area. And again, just kind of laying out the recommendations there, but we're going to keep trucking through here for time considerations. And I'll hand it over to Megan. So to achieve a sense of visual consistency and character that creates an overall vibrant and culturally rich area, the design theme recommends bright and eclectic building colors, such as those shown in these images and also recommends the use of wood and facade design of buildings to emphasize the role that the forestry industry has played in the evolution of Quenelle. In instances where the use of actual wood is not viable, there, are, there exists metal cladding with printed wood grain design, which was used um, in this crossroads building, um, just as an example. And again, the recommended action um, little section there. So next we have, um, this is a conceptual drawing for the Elliott Street entrance from the Moffat Bridge approach, um, or Marsh Drive, I'm not sure <laughs> the preferred name there. Um, and there are a couple um, streetscape enhancement recommendations here. So first we have the replacement, or. Yeah, first we have the replacement of overhead utilities with street lights and hanging baskets. Um, then the decorative banners, um, which are already in place along North Fraser Drive, but the banners in this area are encouraged to potentially incur um, incorporate local First Nations art, preferably art commissioned by those residing within the plan area to create more of a sense of place for the disadvantaged populations. It was noted through conversations with stakeholders that there are a few residents of the disadvantaged population who have great artistic ability and there is definitely a potential for um, an arts partnership for this kind of idea. <clears throat> Next we have the um, converting of just blank walls um, to include art. Um, converting blank walls into murals is envisioned to increase the plan's area, plan area's cultural viability and introducing more art into the public realm, which also ensure the septed principles, which Ashley talked about in the last presentation. Um, public art initiatives such as murals allow for creative expression without cost barriers and promote a sense of identity and community. Our recommendation is that the murals should not only represent the historic 1930s rural farming community of West Quinnell, but also the historical First Nations significance of the area as well. And just as a note, this doesn't have to be the exact um, mural of um, this area. It's just uh, a conceptual idea, so it could definitely be different. Um, next, we have the petunias, just to d discourage pedestrians from walking in the dangerous areas. And a decorative crosswalk, um, potentially with First Nations art. Relocation of bollards, just for safety. And a welcome signage feature with boulders to protect the signage. And in the bottom corner, you can see that's the existing um, image of the area. So the implementation of the plan is proposed to be viewed as a community approach looking at a collaborative effort between the city, committed stakeholders, um, because neighborhood improvement at the end of the day is going to have to come through joint action. The first step in mobilizing the action plan would be the creation of the implementation committee consisting of key city staff and neighborhood leaders and motivators, so um, key people such as stakeholders and business association, uh, peers in the area 
et cetera, the committee mandate would be to choose action items from the plan on an annual or semi-annual basis and, co and coordinate with the various identified groups in the community to determine who is responsible for driving the action items and how they might be accomplished. The implementation matrix within the actual document outlines the key actions associated with the implementation of the overall revitalization plan. The proposed target um, timeframes are based on a combination of perceived support, some easy wins that can happen right away, resources, funding allocations, and the biggest impacts for investments. The actual project implementation will be determined between the city and the implementation committee. So to wrap things up, we just wanted to thank Mayor and Council um, and staff for your time this evening to allow us to present both revitalization plans and we're available to answer any questions that you may have regarding the North Fraser Drive landing um, plan. Thank you, good work. Okay, now I'm gonna go to Council for uh, questions and comments. Gotta be somebody. Oh, Councillor Rudenberg. Of course, sure. Um, I, I love the fact that, that there is a lot of that First Nations component on the west side because I know we have several offices that are also on the west side. Um, I also happen to work with the BIA. So when I look, when you talk about partnerships, I, I see some interesting things coming forward. Um, I didn't know we had a city mural refresh grant application program. Is that something that we have? Sorry, I just Sorry. saw that in the... It's just something that we saw on the website. I don't know if it currently exists or not, but it, the recommendation was either to improve it or if it doesn't exist, then oh, create okay. a new one. Because I didn't know we had a grant program for that. So <laughs> anyway, um, and again, I think, you know, th this, this opportunity to refresh and to um, create different spaces again because I know we've also talked about on the river side how we can create uh, hubs again you know whether it's a an extension to like a landing area where you can have a meal or etc and I know that uh, Councillor Goulet has um, been working on some projects over there around the housing and so when you talk about that that raised concept and having the parking you know at ground level and then the buildings above it that was very much part of one of the plans that had has come to uh, council. So uh, again, I look forward to seeing how we can move forward with uh, all these different concepts. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Rodenberg. Now I'm going to go to Councillor Runge, please. Yes, thanks again. And I'm going to use, once again, it adds to the whole transformative nature of everything that's going on here. So it's actually, it's actually great. Once again, my questions are a little bit more back to our consultation because to me 20% is low. Uh, the printed copies, the 157, how many of those were, were returned? Um, I believe we didn't have any, unfortunately. Did All we right. have one, actually? Um, we had a few, but unfortunately they weren't completed or they were answered incorrectly. And, and, and then, uh, thank you. Uh, this, the second question was with regards to stakeholder discussions. Uh, so the stakeholders then would be uh, we reached out to business owners in the area um, and as well as people that owned, uh, sorry, I don't want to say that. Um, so Northern Health owns um, a building in the area. Um, so key, I guess, civic and commercial uses. Anybody that owned that, we had reached out to via email and mail. So Tony, I take it they went to you and, and to Northern Health and then the other business I believe is closed down up on the hill right now. So I just, uh, to, for me, it's, it goes to all these things. I, I love what you guys are doing, and I don't want to belittle what's being done here. But for me, I always like to, uh, I like to have a little bit more f data with with these things because we get you're throwing data at us, 40 completed surveys, web page visits, all that type of stuff. But at the end of the day, we're not really getting to the the nitty gritty of it because I would really love to know what the community around there thinks about this. And if we had zero responses, then we didn't hit the people that we actually want to make changes with. But uh, that being said, you know, I think it's wonderful. And I, I think we should, in our strategic plan, move on with this because it, it is definitely something that's needed. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Runge. Anyone else? I've got a couple of questions if, uh, if nobody wants to jump in. Uh, what it, was a combined elevated walkway or dike not an option? 
Um, yeah, so as um, we had talked about at the beginning, we looked at mainly flood mitigation policy around um, buildings and the construction of buildings. Um, dikes and tiger dams and things like that are structural mitigation. So there's um, reporting that has been done for the city of Quinnell. I believe Urban Systems has done extensive reporting on actual structural flood mitigation for the area. Um, so the scope of work for us was to look at that non-structural side of things on how we can look at making sure homes and buildings are built safely. Uh, Director Turner, did, did you want to comment on that? Thank you. Yeah, we, there's, there's, um, I wouldn't say there's been extensive uh, reports on flood mitigation, on structural flood mitigation. Uh, we've had in the past, you probably were around, uh, uh, Mayor Paul, um, regarding, we've applied for different uh, flood um, mitigation um, dikes, et cetera. Uh, not to, not to uh, unfortunately, we don't have the uh, dikes in place. Um, this, uh, this was not intended to include the full, we just did the flood uh, plain bylaw. Um, and and um, uh, are continue to work uh, towards, uh, 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 you know, educating people on the flood risks. Um, yeah, thank you. And I, and I like the comment about uh, removing the derelict buildings, um, and not specifically, in my view, for the for the flood risk, but for fire and for vagrancy. So I'm 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 happy to see that. Um, with regard to waiving building permit fees, I would be more in favor of offering um, a half price reduction so that at least we do see some cost recovery out of that because we don't want to sort of push everything over to the taxpayer and so we're always looking for um, non-taxpayer funded um, revenue. I'll leave it at that. And finally, oh, on your on your um, slide number four, enhance the public realm. Um, I don't know if everyone appreciates how much, how expensive um, the undergrounding of overhead utilities is is concerned. So that's something that that may be a stumbling block, but certainly not a, a, a complete barrier. I'm sure that we could we could work around it. Um, and also has. Has any thought been given to, or is it maybe a little bit too early to think about um, a better name for this area rather than that long stretched out title? I think the name of the area is North Fraser Landing. The, uh, this is just the revitalization plan for it. Yeah, I think, I think you know, if, if careful consideration and consultation was given to coming up with a, with a good, descriptive, catchy name, uh, it's going to help, help sell the whole project to the community. So no further questions from Council? Oh, Councillor Bick. Sorry, Mr. Mayor. I just one reflection, a little bit on what Councillor Runge was alluding to with engagement. And... This area certainly has challenges um, with some of the quality of the housing. Um, obviously, there's this is an area where there's a population, some population that struggles. And I think for us to really get a sense for what this neighborhood, how this neighborhood feels about some of these initiatives, I think we're going to have to be a bit more aggressive on how we um, outreach to this community here and, and to the point of door-to-door -door outreach where we actually have to talk to these people face-to-face -to, -face, um, to really get a sense of what they believe in in terms of what their neighborhood should be like. So I don't know, that's just uh, my two cents on improving our engagement for this area. but. Um, they're part of the process. They're, gonna, they're, the, they're the key stakeholder, and they're not responding to us in traditional methods. So I think we're going to have to be a bit more um, um, overt. Uh, thank you, Councillor Bick. Is there anything further before we move on to our next item of business? If I, if I can jump in, Ron, to to Trustee Runge and Trustee uh, uh, Trustee uh, Councillors. Runge and, and Vic, uh, it is uh, uh, needing to get to that door to door. Um, being over there, um, there is uh, uh, 
uh, uh, being quite active in my role as the ED for the for the Friendship Center and understanding, but getting that message out there. I think that a door to door campaign uh, would be something to look at. I'm not sure. We've tried to get some. Uh, um, things done and some surveys around that's been pretty tough it's like you got to actually get out there and do that piece so I think there's something we need to work on there just as our as our communication and, and if we want them to be fully engaged just my two cents I think it's a wonderful uh, uh, um, what's happening over on the North Fraser Drive in that whole area I think the, uh, that community or that area is really uh, I'm happy you know they think they're seeing something being done uh, for that, some of the some of the structures over there have been there for for many years. You look at the building I'm in, 50 years, 60 years. I mean, some of those places are uh, have just been there and haven't had that opportunity to to expand. So I think there'll be some good things coming on that area for the North Strait Drive. So I'd like to see it in the strategic plan how we move forward. Uh, thank you, Councillor Goulet. I'm sorry I didn't see you. Your, your image is about the size of a postage stamp there, so I, I kind of missed it. Anything more from Council, from staff, from the consultants? Hearing none, thank you very much. A job well done, and uh, we look forward to discussing both of these projects uh, further. Pretty exciting. Thank you. Okay, the next item on our agenda is the Quinnell Ballfield Action Plan, RF Binney and Associates. I have uh, Blair Arbuthnot. Um, uh, is, is Blair online? Okay. Indeed, Blair. Oh, there he is. Okay, another postage stamp. Thank you. Okay, well, just got, let, um, let staff set up the technology and um, then we'll, uh, we'll be ready to go. Sounds good. Okay, I think we are ready to go, so the floor is yours. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Appreciate you taking the time and allowing us to speak today. Um, before I get started, I'd just like to share my screen so that you're able to see the presentation in full. So would you be so kind to confirm everyone can share, see the screen okay? Looks good from here. Excellent. <clears throat> Okay, so um, thanks again for welcoming me to the uh, council meeting today to present the Quinnell Ballfield Action Enhancement Plan. So a quick overview for uh, Mayor and Council. So we'll go over just a little bit of the reason on what we're doing, a little bit of the background, and then moving on to uh, the engagement tactics and the outcome of recommendations. So included in the council package, you've got the full report. I will not be going through page by page. Uh, so in front of you today on the presentation is intended to be a snapshot of the highlights of that report. The project purpose for the enhancement plan is really intended to be a uh, an action plan. So we want to ensure that the, the city and decision makers have a, a clear idea on what the local ball groups are needing to centralize the ball activities at the city. Um, the plan is to be specific and we want to ensure that it's gonna be realistically implemented through a number of strategic investments and the related infrastructure that we're going to be proposing. So really trying to nail down uh, some bite-sized pieces that helps to support uh, the background on, on why we're here, which is in 2015, the city undertook a parks, green spaces, and outdoor recreation master plan. And in that plan, it identified a surplus of ball fields. So since 2015, uh, the city has decommissioned a number of ball fields and has also worked with the CRD to make sure that um, investments are going through the, the, rec, the North Caribou Rec and Park Services and developing those ball fields at Ranger Park and Barlow Creek. The primary focus of our action plan is strategically identifying West Fraser Timber Park as well as Ranger Park. So those are the two locations that we're zeroed in on uh, in an effort to consolidate ball activities. <clears throat> Pardon me. Additional ball fields are located throughout the city and the regional district. 
uh, some are in poor condition or other, other locations have been identified for other uses to support the consolidation of ball play in the city. Um, just as a little bit of background on the existing conditions, so uh, my team and I uh, visited the sites uh, earlier this year in, in May and uh, provided some background documentation in terms of site photos, available as-built information, and GIS in information to uh, confirm feasibility of what the future recommendations may be on the two sites. So um, for those that are not familiar with Forest Fraser Timber Park, um, currently we've got one baseball diamond, which uh, in this diagram here is kind of that larger central area just on the north side. We've got four softball diamonds, parking lots, playgrounds, um, and field house building and washrooms. It's a, it's a fantastic facility uh, to be fair, and it's uh, been, very well used and it offers a lot of uh, potential in terms of how to maximize its efficiency to serve all users uh, focused on ball diamonds and ball, ball sports. Ranger Park at Barlow Creek is a little bit more outside of the town centre. It's got three slow pitch diamonds, parking lot, playground, uh, the hall and washrooms, uh, primarily used for slow pitch. Um, while we were there, we met with uh, Quinnell minor baseball as well as girls softball. Uh, so that was uh, the project team and city staff and um, had some excellent discussions of which in the back of the report is a summary of the uh, engagement discussions that were had. Uh, unfortunately, uh, adult slow pitch was not able to attend the in-person meeting and uh, an alternate time was arranged in June for us to meet virtually with them and just ascertain their comments on the existing facilities that they currently use, uh, looking at trends in the registration for their user group and as well as identifying potential facility needs to help support the uh, growth and uh, development of their sport. So a quick summary of, of where the registration numbers are currently. Um, as with everybody uh, throughout the world, quite frankly, in 2020, uh, many seasons were cut short or canceled altogether due to COVID. Uh, so we did go back a little bit further into 2019 to try to establish a little bit of a baseline as far as where registration numbers are. Um, a common trend, uh, particularly after COVID, is uh, a bounce back uh, quite strong of, of registration numbers and uh, Quinnell Minor Baseball saw that bounce back as well as introducing a new level of play called blast ball, similar to t-ball, uh, ages three to four, and in 2022 had almost 250 registrations. Girls softball is, is seeing somewhat of a, of a steady registration number with a nominal decline in, in recent years from 150 to 120. And adult slow pitch is, is bouncing back again from the 2019 uh, numbers of 16 teams. Uh, 2021 saw a, a decline in, to nine with a continual bounce back up to 12. So in, we'll go over the, the details in, in the next few slides, but in terms of the, the big picture recommendations, what we're offering is at West Fraser Timber Park is to optimize the layout and programming at that location through a strategic phased implementation uh, based on the concept plan that was shared in the, in the report. Uh, I'll bring forward the diagram just shortly, but as, um, big picture improvements have been identified. What we're going to be proposing uh, through this concept plan is reprogramming the existing Bantam baseball diamond, that larger north field, and replacing it with a new Bantam and midget diamond. The, the advantage of reprogramming the Bantam diamond will also allow the development of three additional baseball diamonds which would be two new tadpole mosquito diamonds and one new t-ball blast ball diamond. 
Uh, we're also looking at reprogramming the one existing uh, softball diamond, diamond number one, replacing it with a peewee diamond and uh, identifying some new amenity options to help facilitate uh, better training and development program offerings uh, during fringe weather seasons. And this is what the graphic looks like in terms of what those uh, proposal recommendations are. So what you can see in the, in the center uh, location there of the previous large scale Bantam diamond is uh, still a Bantam diamond, but it has been reduced. The existing diamond that's there now uh, is greatly oversized for its intended purpose uh, to meet the age group. And by bringing in the outfield fences, it actually opens up a lot more space on the north side there to facilitate uh, younger kids uh, to be playing there for t-ball, blast ball, and mosquito. So those are for those that are not familiar with those um, uh, division names. It goes all the way down to uh, blast ball, which is ages uh, three and four, and all the way up to mosquito, which is um, under 11 years old. And as far as the, um, the development or redevelopment of diamond number one, softball diamond number one, that's to the uh, left or to the southwest of the Bantam diamond, which has been reprogrammed to a peewee diamond with the option of adding as a, a challenger uh, skin surface and field. So to break that down just a little bit further, um, I'll be flipping back and forth just to help your orientation to the site. Uh, so we've identified this concept plan overall and then offered a way to phase it. What, what bite needs to be taken first, so to speak? Uh, to facilitate the development of this concept plan, phase one would be to uh, address the the large bantam diamond and those are identified in these elements here under phase one so removal of the of the men's diamond replace it with a smaller bantam diamond so included in that would be adjusting the outfield fencing it would be realigning some pathways uh, new grandstand would be uh, required and um, <coughs> pardon me um, and, and providing an option for uh, portable bleachers as well. Phase two would be uh, the uh, tadpole mosquito diamonds in the northeast. So that would be these ones in the in the northeast corner here. The uh, scope to, to relocate and, and to develop those diamonds would be including new infields, new backstops, new dugouts, uh, portable bleachers, as well as installing um, a, uh, a blast ball facility. And that blast ball facility would be that center one that you don't really see a, an infield for. Blast ball is for those three to four year olds that uh, uh, don't necessarily hit the ball very far, so to speak. <laughs> And phase three would be replacing the girls softball uh, diamond one with the peewee diamond. So that would be in the left-hand corner here. And finally, phase four would be the uh, development of the tadpole mosquito diamond in the no Northwest. Um, for those familiar with the site, there's a train caboose uh, over in the parking lot area there that would be uh, required to uh, be relocated uh, to facilitate the redevelopment of those diamonds. And if we we're to overlay what phase one through four uh, would look like, this would be uh, what the phasing plan would be. A little bit easier to read. So the uh, yellow shading in the center there is phase one. Uh, phase two, shaded with the red, uh, is the uh, redevelopment of the mosquito and uh, peewee diamonds. And phase three is the blue, and phase four is the purple. Uh, for those that are have a keen eye, there's also a, a fifth phase, which is uh, identified in green shading, which I'll talk about next. The purpose of the green phase five areas is a little bit more of an a la carte amenity elements that could be um, incorporated as well. 
So in terms of what the budgeting is for the phasing plan, we've identified it uh, here based on 2022 uh, competitive bid numbers, uh, cost, e cost estimate. And phase five, a little bit of an a la carte, uh, identifies the potential for batting cages. It identifies uh, new uh, unserviced washroom buildings, sports field lighting, uh, additional grandstands, as well as a, a unique opportunity to pr uh, provide artificial turf infields for the uh, peewee diamond. That artificial turf um, would be in the phase three, but could be implemented at any time. Uh, and it would be just uh, specific to the infield area. It would not be for the full facility. For those interested, um, part of the um, identification of the artificial turf infield would be, again, to help facilitate year-round play or extend the fringe seasons, as we all know. Uh, baseball is a fair weather sport in a lot of cases, and uh, it's a fairly short season that begins kind of in late spring and goes through early summer. Uh, so a lot of the amenities that have been identified uh, for this phase five are intended to help support off-season training, spring and fall ball opportunities, and um, help expand that uh, programming potential at West Fraser Timber Park. So just again, as a refresher, here's what that uh, refresh concept plan is as a part of the action plan. Moving over to uh, Ranger Park at Barlow Creek. Um, ultimately, the, the programming for Ranger Park is being proposed to remain uh, the same as uh, largely a slow pitch specific facility. Um, it's an adult play and it's out of town um, and it, it supports the, um, the adult league play and tournaments there with uh, ample parking as well as some other facilities that help support uh, the hall. But to, to further kind of identify some increased quality of play opportunities, we've identified a few different options which could include uh, taller outfield fencing, the, the reason for taller outfield fencing is that the outfield fencing is a little bit shallow uh, for adult slow pitch. So raising the outfield fencing helps keep the ball in play and uh, make it a little bit more difficult for the adults to hit home runs. Um, also upgrading field lighting to LED. Some of that has already been started, uh, but this would facilitate the completion as well as upgrading some of the bleacher seating and the uh, upgrading of uh, safety netting as well around uh, the, the field areas to help safety. And that draws the presentation for the action plan to a close and I'm happy to take any kind of comments or questions that Mayor and Council may have. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much to you too. Um, now I'm gonna go to Council for any comments, questions. Nothing. Oh, Councillor Bunch, thank you for saving the day. I, did, yeah, I didn't want to leave everybody behind dry. Blair, great presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Elliott. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you very much for the presentation. Very extensive. Um, I'm hoping with all the extra amenities and stuff, we can manage to come up with 1.8 or whatever it is to, to complete this. It's going to be tricky, but it's a good presentation and, uh, and a good thing to try and shoot for, but it's a lot of cash. Um, when it comes right down to the end there, I read, and I'm not seeing it in the pictures, wh uh, why the playground moved, or was that just a, just a deletion there? Uh, for West Fraser Timber Park? Yes. Uh, so to facilitate some of the uh, relocations, the, the playground um, may need to be tweaked up a little bit. It wouldn't require a substantial relocation, but uh, once the detailed design is undertaken, you can assess that at, um, at that stage to uh, tweak up. Now, the unique thing about baseball is there's for certain uh, recommendations for base path dimensions and outfield dimensions, but every every diamond has its own nuance. And so you are able to adjust the outfield 
diamond uh, within that. So for instance, you go to Major League Diamonds, you've got green monsters and you've got short porches and right. Uh, so during the detail design phase, you're able to kind of facilitate um, those nuances once in a final survey is done and undertaken and identify some of the some of the risks in those relocations. Okay, oh, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Jeff. Maybe just to clarify there, there is the children's playground and then there's a fitness area. Uh, it's the fitness area that is being talked about there, not the children's playground, just to make sure that everybody's clear that there's there's no in, intent there anywhere in this plan to uh, move that playground. Uh, thank you. I just need some... Oh, sorry, go ahead, Councillor Vick. Just a question for uh, Blair. So, assuming... Um, all the stars align and we can find the money to action this plan with a new revitalized West Fraser Park uh, um, with the ball diamonds as configured and perhaps changes done to the Barlow um, the Ranger Park would this satisfy the, the current needs of the baseball softball slow pitch community in the community In terms of the available program space for the age groups that I've identified, it does have the, pos the potential to support the current registration numbers um, at one location, yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. I I've got a question if anybody wants to jump in afterwards. Uh, just could you comment on the um, the Rotary Little League Park at Labordi Park. Is, is there the aim to continue with that or meld it into, I see uh, Tadpole and Mosquito, and I'm not sure, that sounds like it's minor baseball. Um, and so is the plan to move minor baseball eventually over to West Fraser Timber Park or allow it to continue at Labordi Park? It, uh, it certainly has the potential to have that as an option, but as far as the, the, the scope of this project was, was to help optimize the uh, West Fraser Timber Park and Ranger Park at Barlow Creek. And if there's additional uh, reviews that need to be made and uh, quite frankly, a desire to centralize the programming that's currently at Laborde Park over to West Fraser Timber Park, then it can be accommodated, but um, I think that would just warrant some additional discussions with uh, city staff and user groups to uh, ensure that that is a, is a feasible option. Uh, thank you, and one more. Um, what is the status, and maybe staff can help out here, of men's baseball? Like, I mean, we're, we're looking at um, bringing more diamonds into West Fraser Timber Park and taking out the men's diamond to accommodate that. Are, is there a man, men's league that is concerned about that, or what, what's the status? Uh, there's currently no men's uh, baseball group. Thank you, I kind of suspected that. And, and finally, I want to sort of express the hope that the, um, the, the caboose can be relocated rather than removed. I know that there are people in the community that, that are interested in refurbishing that old caboose, and let's not forget that the caboose is sort of a, sal or a, a salute, I guess, to our railway heritage, which has always been a big part of our heritage and continues to be so. So I, I hope that there's a there's a rosy future uh, for the caboose. Anything more from Council? Yeah, Councillor Vick. Uh, two more questions. Um, this is maybe for Blair, but probably for Director Norburn. Um, the, the batting cages, um, as outlined as an amenity to be added in a possible phase five, um, I understand that batting cages are a great way to hone skills in the off season. And uh, as articulated in the plan, they would be uh, open to the elements. It, it, what, it, would there be possible to get a cost on enclosing those? Those batting cages so they'd be usable all year round or for a longer period to allow user groups to um, use those f uh, features all year that would be the first question and then the second question um, 
uh, would be with an, an increased density of usage at this park, um, the questions come to our infrastructure to cross the river to get to this park, which is at, at play as well, right? So um, I'm sure that will have to be brought into our bridge rehab question at some point. If we're going to put a major investment in this ballpark uh, facility, then we need to have a safe way for people to get to it, who, uh, as, as baseball is a low cost barrier sport for most, so they'd be walking or biking to their ball games. So we got to make sure they can get there. Okay, Councillor Rudenberg. Uh, I'm sorry, did, did you have a reply to that, Blair? Uh, apologies, uh, Mayor Paul, but yes, the and the one clarification there, or confirmation in terms of an enclosed batting cage um, to, you know, obviously mitigate the impacts of, of, of weather winter uh, or winter weather. Uh, there's a, a number of different options that are, are possible from pre-manufactured structures to custom design and built structures um, and anywhere in between. And we've been involved in a number of those types of structures, depending on, on, on what the needs are and incorporate other amenities as well in terms of um, power and lighting and heaters and storage. And um, it's, it's a little bit of a of a Pandora's box, depending on what the uh, the end use is. Uh, so um, that option definitely exists, and and we can definitely support staff on um, creating or, or generating some additional budget numbers for a range of different um, batting cage styles. Thank you. Now I'm going to go to uh, Councillor Rudenberg. Thank you. And I know that we're not supposed to do a whole lot of history, and I don't think you had the opportunity to be part of this discussion, Blair, but uh, the Rotary Club actually um, had a, a meeting uh, sometime in September, and uh, the discussion of the caboose came up, a question of the ownership and responsibility of the of the caboose. And so we um, ended up uh, speaking with Elizabeth Hunter, who's a museum and heritage manager, here and so her uh, reply back to our Rotary Club was it appears to have been purchased by uh, Mayor Mike Pierce as a tourist attraction around 1985 and placed in Laborde Park uh, in the Chamber of Commerce um, sorry so it was possibly used by the Billy Barker Day Society as an office around 1985 Chamber of Commerce for storage for the Tourist Bureau around 1990 it moved temporarily to the Public Works Yard in 95 when the current Billy Barker Day's office was moved to Laborde Park Park uh, to make way for the senior center with plans to relocate to West Fraser Timber Park once it was developed. So um, that kind of um, gave us a little bit of understanding of where the ownership of the caboose came from. And so right now I know that um, Rotary has taken the response or um, the matter and our response is that we're consulting with the city about the possible renovation of the caboose, uh, knowing that this report was coming forward, et cetera. So that's kind of where Rotary is with the caboose right now. Thank you, Councillor Rudenberg. Anyone else? Well, thank you, Blair. Um, we look forward to seeing how this one unfolds. We've certainly, just in the last two delegations, <laughs> have a lot on our plate. So thank you for that. We'll be, uh, we'll be taking all of that under advisement. We have strategic planning coming up very soon, and certainly uh, those items will be front and foremost on the agenda. Okay, thank you, so thank you. Uh, so now we're going to move to um, committee reports. November 24, 20 to 22 policy and bylaw committee. Uh, I'm going now to Councillor Runge. Well, there is. There's uh, the only thing I know that it says that the minutes will be discussed at the uh, December 13 meeting. But the, uh, there is a, a one item on the agenda, and that is your committee meeting schedule for 2023. You are correct. I stand corrected. Uh, that is correct. We, um, on page 63 of 137, I should have read the top bar there, but is the policy and bylaw committee meeting schedule uh, for 22 uh, December and all of 2023 just for your information. And uh, I guess we need to have it approved. So I hope you're moving that. I certainly am. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't have my mic for a second. 
And Antoni, or <laughs> Councillor Goulet, uh, seconding it. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Carried. Uh, thank you, Councillor Runge. Now we're going to go to Director of Community Services regarding the Quinnell Regional Airport Contribution Agreement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. To obtain approval, uh, the purpose of this report is to obtain approval from Council to enter into the attached uh, Quinnell Regional Airport Contribution Agreement with the Caribou Regional District. Uh, in 2018, the CRD held a referendum for residents of area A, B, C, and I to establish an airport service in the North Caribou in order to contribute funding toward the cost of operating the Quinnell Regional Airport. Uh, the referendum was successful, and the city and the regional district entered into a three-year contribution agreement based on terms agreed to by the parties prior to the referendum. Uh, that three-year agreement expired at the end of 2021 and a new agreement is required. Uh, under the terms of the proposed new three-year uh, renewal agreement, the CRD will contribute $68,500, uh, which is about a 5.3% increase, uh, beginning in 2022 or this year uh, toward the operating cost of the uh, airport. Uh, approving this agreement for a three-year term will result in a renewal date that is consistent with a number of memorandums of understandings that the city and the CRD have, which will allow this agreement to be renewed as part of that uh, renewal process every five years. Uh, a resolution of council is required to enter into the agreement and to authorize the corporate administrator and the mayor to sign it. Uh, the recommendation is that council approve entering into the three-year uh, Quinnell Regional Airport contribution agreement with the Caribou Regional District effective January 1st, 2022, and that the Mayor and City Manager be authorized to execute such documentation as required to enter into the agreement. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Runge, are you just moving that? Uh, Councillor uh, Councillor Rudenberg seconded. I do have one question, and that is why, why are we just about a year late uh, with this? Um, it's something that we talked about at the start of the year. It just hasn't come forward. It has gone to the uh, uh, Northern Caucus, and they have uh, agreed to the terms of this. Uh, it's just a, sort of, I guess, a housekeeping thing. Um, the CRD's already contributed the uh, the normal or the previous sixty-five thousand dollars. So, uh, signing this agreement will just allow them to to provide the the balance owing. Okay. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed, carried. Next one is uh, to the Director of Community Services again, and this is the Quinnell Kangaroos Agreement. Uh, yes, thank you. The purpose of this report is to obtain council approval as the manager of the North Caribou Recreation and Park Service to enter into an agreement with the Quinnell Kangaroo Senior Hockey Club for their use of the West Fraser Centre. Uh, the current agreement with the Quinnell Kangaroos Hockey Club has expired but has been renewed on a month-to-month -month basis until terms of a new agreement are negotiated. Uh, to simplify the administration and execution of the agreement, it is between the city as the manager of the North Caribou Recreation and Park Service and the club. Um, and doesn't include uh, the CRD. Uh, that said, uh, the proposed agreement went to and was approved by the Joint Advisory Committee at its meeting on November 15th with the recommendation that the agreement be approved by Quinnell City Council. Uh, the agreement is attached to the report and the recommendation is uh, that Council enter into the attached agreement with the Quinnell Kangaroo Senior Hockey Club for their use of the West Fraser Centre for the 2022-2023 season and that the Mayor and corporate administrator be authorized to execute such documentation as required to complete the agreement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Norburn. Uh, uh, Councillor Elliott, moving it. Uh, Councillor Vick, seconding it. I just have one. Anybody else got a question here? And I noticed under advertising, second bullet, liquor or tobacco advertising is not permitted. Does that make it uh, difficult or impossible for our hometown Barkerville Beer Brewing Company to put their sign up? Uh, it does make it impossible for the Quinnell Kangaroos to sell a rink board ad to uh, any business that sells alcohol, yes. Okay, thank you. It was a nice try. Um, anything more before we vote? All in favor? Opposed? Carry. And the next item is the um, 
annual review of council remuneration and expenses and I will go to, who am I going to here? Am I going to the director of financial services or who? Thank you, I, I didn't see it on the, or on the uh, report, thank you. Thanks. So the purpose of this report is to review the council remuneration policy and the increase to council remuneration effective January 1st, 2023. I've attached a copy of the policy that was approved in 2019. Um, as everyone knows, currently the inflation is quite high, so the increase this year would be 7.7%. .7%. So we just wanted council to have a chance to take a look at this. So the recommendation is that council provide any input it desires on the council remuneration policy. Okay, thank you. I have the floor is open for discussion. Anyone? Uh, Councillor Bick. So I don't have any issues with the principle of tag or aligning our remuneration with um, the CPI, Computer uh, Consumer Price Index. But I wonder if when we created this policy, that we envisioned a time when we would increase our remuneration by eight per, almost eight percent. So um, I'm just mindful of the cost increase, and uh, there's going to be other but there's going to be other items later on this agenda which are sort of relative to um, com the consumer price index as well. And um, I'll just I'll just say that I'm mindful of the, the increase that uh, will be borne by taxpayers by this, and. Uh, I'm wondering if we if we thought that maybe in another in another in another discussion we would um, limit our increases to an average or limit our increases to a number that is typical. And I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Councillor Elliott. Oh uh, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so. So I think it's I think it's important that we continue to work with the CPI and the respect that um, you know taking just trying to be principled and taking zeros across the board is not the way in my opinion to go about it. I've seen other communities that have done that and they end up playing catch up at the end of the day when they get a new council and figure out that they're so far behind the game. But as Councillor Vic has mentioned, 7.7 .7 is unprecedented. So for clarity for the public, if it ever goes down, which I'm not sure that it really has, um, we don't go down, we stay at zero. Typically, inflation is at 2%, but this is just absolutely exceptional. So um, I think that, that there should be a cap on it as well, and I would, I would suggest that maybe that cap is at 3%, and um, I will leave it to have for discussion, but I'm ready to make that motion if, if, uh, if and when necessary. Uh, thank you. I, I do have something to add, but I'd like to see council go through the mill first. I'm sorry, Councillor Runge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you know what, my original thing was, hey, we're principled. We said this, this is a contract, this is what we stick with. I'm not sure if 3% is the right amount, but uh, you know, I have a question, I guess it goes to, uh, you know, in my discussion around this prior to, he prior to here, it goes to Director Bolton. And it's with regards to, if we take a 7.7% .7 increase, Will that affect other negotiations or could that affect other negotiations with other things that we have at the city, uh, different types of contracts, and will it adversely affect us? I know, you know, maybe this is to Byron too, you know, I'm not sure. Uh, I, go, ahead. go ahead, city manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, having sat in, I presume you're talking poss potentially about negotiations with our unionized workforce. And having sat in on those negotiations several times and, and leading that process, I, ha I have had conversations with them which they generated about the level of pay increase that's, that council got. Is it connected? In no way should this be connected to the, the rate that QP gets. QP gets an hourly rate based on the work that they do. This is more, this is not, re, council's remuneration is not reflective of an hourly rate. It's reflective of a uh, fair remuneration for what council does. So that's my, th in theory, I don't think there's a connection, but will you hear about it in the future like there is a connection? Absolutely you will. 
Councillor Runge. Councillor Runge. That's okay. I'll come back to that. Sorry. You're good for now? Uh, uh, Councillor McKelvey. Uh, just, I think 7.7% is too high as well. I just want to make that statement. Well, another thing if that I is, may. Sorry, go ahead, uh, Councillor Goulet. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. And just weighing in uh, and uh, 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 Councillor Elliott's point, you know, that, that this is an exceptional um, year, I guess, for the CPI index. Uh, usually sometimes it remains at zero for several years, jumps up 1%, maybe 2%, goes back down and stays within that area of that 1% to 2%, uh, maybe even 3% as you go as far as 4%. And I think we need to tie it to uh, uh, to that index. That's just my thoughts. I don't think by putting a cap on it, I think we're just going to go through an exceptional year. I know it seems like a, a huge uh, increase, and it, it's just the, the times uh, that we're in. So that's just my... Uh, thank you. Oh, Councillor Rudenberg. Thank you. And I have sat on council where it was below zero. And um, we actually, that's why we ended up putting that, we could not go any lower than zero percent increase because it actually was a minus. And it was like, so do we actually take money away from our stipend? So we, that's why some of this has um, been moved forward as it is now that you cannot go below zero. Um, so just, again, a little historical piece to it. Thank you. Director of Financial. Yeah, I was just going to add to that history. It was in 2010 when CPI was negative 1.2%. That's when Council added the floor to the policy that we couldn't go below zero. Uh, thank you. I don't know if we're headed to a resolution yet, but I would like to, with respect, ask the mover to consider adding into a resolution if it looks like it's heading to 3 or 3.5 per whatever, um, that the mayor's salary be reduced by $10,000. I think it's ridiculously high in, in proportionate to others. So there, there you have it. Is, is that a motion? No. Nope. I oh. want to speak to this first. We don't have a motion on the floor, right? No. We do not. We do not have a motion on the floor. So. I'm not sure if this is the place to do that, but you know, because we go through this with teachers and with other types of jobs and the other types of things right now. And we, we have to understand, even though it's very uncomfortable, inflation is this. So you're saying I'm willing to work, if my 100 bucks this year is only worth $93 this year, you're willing to take a salary decrease here when inflation is higher than this. That being said, Maybe we have a motion on the floor that says we cap it at 5%. But you know what? If we ever get inflation at 20% or some craziness, because our world is wacky right now, we're going to tie ourselves, you know, we're going to hog tie ourselves. And this is the issue that we have. And for you to say I'm going to take down the, the uh, salary of the mayor, I think is a mistake. Because we can say that here today. You might say it here today because you're comfortable. But we want the best people in the position and if and the mayor's job is a full-time job and we it's I know years ago it was done as a part-time position with other mayors and things like that but the mayor's job is a it's it's a lot of hours and you know I I had this discussion with uh, Mr. Rick before with regards to our salary you know relative to the hours spent researching reading and all that type of stuff well we're most likely at one or two bucks an hour so just you know you know we have to realize that our this fourteen thousand dollar increase for the seven of us in the scheme of our what is it twenty million twenty five million dollar budget is actually not that big. Uh, thank you. Councillor Scott. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> um, so ditto to Councillor Runge. I, uh, I appreciate um, you saying that you would take a $10,000 reduction and, and I'm glad that you're, you're comfortable. Um, with your finances and things like that, but I don't believe that it's fair for the next people that come along. Um, then first, then we're going to have a, a conversation about the potential of bringing that back up ten thousand dollars to make it fair for someone that's leaving their job. Like, um, 
I, I, that's a, a bad road to go down. I, I appreciate it. I think that uh, your heart's in the right place, but I think we have to think about the next councils, the next mayor that are coming in line. And that's, like I said, that's why when you look at other communities that took zeros across the board, it took them years to get that back up again. They were all just losing money and going backwards. So I'm ready to make a, a resolution if you're uh, willing. <laughs> Well, re remember that I don't get a vote um, just uh, unless it's a tiebreaker. Uh, we went through that one before, but uh, I, my effort was mainly to try to bring my pay packet closer to the average that's shown on this report. I don't know how many municipalities are listed there, probably um, maybe 20 or 15 or something like that. The average is um, 40. I could look at my put on my cheek forty one thousand and so even even if my um, my pay packet was reduced by ten thousand I'd still be ten thousand above the average so that's where I was going with that. I understand that, Mr. Mayor. That's ten thousand of the average that is listed in this. There's other communities too, but but I just think on principle it makes it a very difficult situation for someone that may not be retired and may not be comfortable. Um, and you know, I think we have to keep the opportunity open for for every individual uh, to to sit in that chair. Thank you for that. And the floor is open to a motion. I would make that motion, Mr. Mayor. You're making a motion to what? That we continue with um, having a zero. Sorry, the wording isn't going to be perfect. Uh, if we go into a negative, but at this point in time, with inflation at almost eight percent, I recommend that we move forward with a four percent cap. So, just to be clear, you're you're recommending a four percent uptick this year. Yes, Mr. Mayor. The half of CPI. Do I have a seconder? Seconder, Councillor Vick. Uh, now discussion, Councillor Runge. Thank you, so, to, to Councillor Elliott. Uh, I agree that it might be too high this year. I am wondering, instead of saying a cap, because we don't know what the future will bring, if we could have a friendly amendment that says maybe the average three years around it. That way, it takes the bump out of any big increase, but if, it, if increases continue into the future, we also don't hamstring us on that. Uh, Councillor Elliott. I appreciate the uh, recommendation to amend, but we can have the same conversation next year as well. So I'm, I'm trying to be principled in half of the CPI, which is something we've never done before. And then, as Councillor Runge mentions, if something goes haywire next year again, then we can also have that conversation. Uh, thank you, Councillor Elliott. I'm still looking for a seconder or, or discussion. Uh, Councillor uh, Rudenberg. Thank you. Um, Okay, because I think it was just the way that you um, put the resolution out there, Councillor Elliott, that about capping it. So you're not talking about trying to change our policy. You're just talking about for this year, correct? Because it almost sounded like you wanted to change the policy. So I just want to be perfectly clear. I, I think I know what you're saying, but it sounded like a policy change. Is there a difference? <laughs> mm. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say is I'm trying to agree with Councillor Runge that if we if we change the policy and go with 4% right now, which is half of the CPI, and something goes haywire next year, we can still have that conversation again. No, I, 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 this is a policy and bylaw issue, I believe. It should be covered in the bylaw policy and bylaw committee and brought back. I agree with... If, if you want to make a motion to say for this year we have it four percent, we could argue that instead of my, you know, average. But I think the other portion should come back to policy and bylaws so we discuss it in a more wholesome manner. That's fair. I'm good with the recommendation, Mr. Mayor, of uh, changing it to four percent for this year. Okay, so I have a motion to, to go four percent for this coming year. Do I have a seconder? Yeah, I seconded. Seconded, Councillor Vic. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor? Opposed? Uh, let me see, I've got, have I got two opposed? The, the motion carries. And did you want those recorded? 
Okay, thank you. Okay, maybe a little bit easier would be um, the Moonshine Coffee Limited uh, lease agreement, and I go to the Director of Community Services. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. The purpose of this report is to obtain council approval to amend the lease agreement with Moonshine Coffee Limited uh, for use of the upper floor of Shirawi House. Uh, Moonshine Coffee Limited entered into a five-year lease with the City of Quinell effective June 1st, 2021 for use of the upper floor of Shirawi House to operate a coffee roasting business and a food and beverage cafe. Uh, the lease was based on a commercially competitive market rate of $10 per square foot per year and included a clause that it, uh, results in an annual increase based on the year-to-year -year increase in the BC Consumer Price Index, or the CPI. On June 1st, 2022, the CPI was applied to the first annual increase resulting in a 3.1% increase to rent. Uh, this increase was higher than the tenant anticipated, but even more concerning was the 7.8% increase in the CPI in October, suggesting that future increases could be substantially higher than 3.1%. Uh, Moonshine Coffee Limited has indicated that there is a risk that the business may not be sustainable at this location if they can't reduce their overhead costs and to that end have requested that the city consider an amendment to the lease to reduce their rent increase and provide some predictability to their rent. Uh, the community charter stipulates that a council must not provide a grant, benefit, advantage or other form of assistance to a business which places some limitations on the degree to which the city can provide an accommodation. Any adjustment to the rent must be consistent with fair market value and cannot be considered a subsidy. Uh, many of the city's commercial leases do have fixed rates for the full term of the agreement. Uh, renewals of existing leases uh, recently have been often been based on a 2% increase uh, with the new rate then fixed for a five-year term, including a number of leases at City Hall, uh, the MLA, Modi, uh, and Vista Radio all have a fixed rate. Uh, leases. Uh, the city's own lease renewal for Spirit Center was based on a 2% increase over the previous agreement, increasing the lease rate from $10 per square foot to $10.20 per square foot per year, uh, and then fixed for a five-year term. Uh, the city's expenses related to Shirawi House uh, are largely unaffected by the, or, uh, the Shirawi House lease are largely unaffected by inflation. Uh, under the terms of the agreement, Moonshine Coffee Limited is responsible for utility charges and all maintenance and operating costs, and not the city. Uh, amending the lease agreement with Moonshine Coffee Limited to replace the annual increase in the lease rate by the CPI with a 2% increase in the first year and a fixed rate for the balance of the term would result in a lease rate that is similar to other commercial leases in the city, including the city's own lease for Spirit Center, and would be uh, consistent with the increase that has been incorporated into other leases the city holds with commercial tenants. Uh, the financial implications, the first year of the lease generated $18,000 in direct revenue to the city, in addition to property taxes for the lease space, uh, and increasing the lease by 2% in 2022 will result in an additional $360 in additional revenue over the previous year, which is $198 less than it would be if the 3.1% CPI increase were implemented. Uh, the recommendation is that Council approve an amendment to the attached five-year lease uh, with Moonshine Coffee for use of the upper floor of Shirawi House in Laborde Park to replace the wording in Article 7, which stipulates that the lease will be increased annually by the CPI, to state that the lease rate will be increased by 2% effective June 1, 2022, and then remain fixed for the balance of the term so as to make the lease agreement more consistent with other commercial leases that the City holds. Uh, thank you, Councillor uh, Elliott is moving the recommendation. Uh, Councillor Vick seconding the recommendation. Uh, any, oh, Councillor Runge. And you thought this was going to be easy. All right, so I've got a couple questions. The first question I think goes to Director Bolton with regards to the taxes paid by them. So, do we have that number? I believe it's approximately 350 a month, but they pay the full property taxes on that property. All right, and the second question I guess is to Jeff. Uh, when we started this lease a few years ago, I believe my recollection is that we gave a few months of free rent to them to get going. 
Um, yeah, because of COVID, Council did approve a 50% reduction uh, in the lease rate for the first three months of the agreement. All right, so then that goes on to this way, to my point. I hate renewing a contract halfway through a contract. That's what I'm going to start out with because that's why. Uh, and for a business to say they're going to go out of business with a difference of 1400 bucks a year, I say we're in more trouble than we think, if that's really the truth. And then the other things that I really believe that we should consider as a council, that building is our building. That roof will have to be redone. Roofing costs, according to that paper from Rona, just are up 60% in the last couple of years. Those costs will be borne by the city. So they have to, or they should be recouped by the city too in some way. I really think that's important. So uh, I'm okay if we don't go with the CPI. I do want some sort of an increase. You know, if we go based on our council thing that we just came across here, a 4% increase this year and CPI maybe to a max of 4 or a max of 3%, for sure, that'd be fine. I disagree with the idea of saying, oh, look, we're going to go back and we're now going to give them money back from, till June for a lower price than was negotiated because they originally negotiated a three point something till June 30th, I believe. So I guess, you know, for that reason alone, like I'd like to, you know, I'd like to support them, but I think we should have some sort of an increase in, in their rental amount. And, you know, I can't, I can't accept the recommendation as it sits right now. Uh, thank you, Councillor Runge. Now I'm going to go to Council, uh, Councillor Elliott. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so to the point of repairing the roof and things like that, this the City Hall is city-owned as well, and we've got um, other businesses in here that are locked in at 2%. So with that kind of an argument, we should be raising everybody's rent. Um, so for me, just to have it consistent, like many of the other uh, city-owned uh, businesses that we have, uh, city-owned buildings that we have, and making the, the term fixed is the way to go and just a, a, a fair playing field. Uh, thank you, Councillor Elliott. Uh, Councillor Vick? Yeah, I'll echo what Councillor Elliott's uh, intimated with consistency, um, and in fact, um, in the in the in the private sector, if, for lack of a better term, with leases signed by retailers and whatnot, I, I can honestly say in my 25 years in, in the business, I've never heard of a, a rental rate tied to CPI. Uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a usually a five-year agreement with a rate for rent indicated clearly on each year. So um, I believe consistency is in order. And um, I would ask, I don't know if we have any other leases tied to CPI, but we should seriously look at modern modifying all of them. I think it's uh, it, it ca can cause a lot of uncertainty to a business when, frankly, they're trying to uh, balance their books every year and they're not sure exactly what their rent's going to turn into. So I would I would ask that we look into that. And then uh, Councillor Runch has brought a, a good point up regarding um, future expenses, uh, particularly with a roof or HVAC system. Um, I'd like to ask, do we have a, a method or mechanics where we can set up a contingency fund where a percentage of rent can go into a contingency fund to fund large capital expenses in commercially rented spaces, either like City Hall or like um, Sarawi House. Uh, thank you, Councillor Vick. Um, anyone from staff want to comment on that one? Uh, Director Bolton. I think that's part of a broader discussion that we'll probably have during strategic planning of how we fund replacements of buildings. So right now, all that revenue is going into general revenue. So if you wanted to take it out and target it somewhere else, we could, but that's a shortage of general revenue we'd have to make up. But it definitely, we need to talk about how we fund the replacement of buildings since we made the change to the capital reinvestment reserve. Uh, Councillor Runge. Can I respond to both, uh, both uh, Councillor Vick and Councillor Elliott? In the future, I have no problem with doing what you guys are saying. That's not a problem. But I do have an, I have a problem with going, with significantly changing contract terms partway through a contract when we already gave incentive originally. The idea that the business is going to go under on this amount, I think is, a fa is false. I just, I, I've been, you know, there's enough traffic in that place that this shouldn't, you know, we're, we're dealing with, a hundred cups of coffee, you know, or, you know, it's not that much, you know, so, so when we start changing contracts midway through, I think that opens a Pandora's box for all sorts of other things going forward. Thank you. Councillor Elliott. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
I think the responsibility falls on us. I don't think we should have gone with the CPI to begin with. I think it's a bad idea, as Councillor Vick said. So I think it should be consistent with all other uh, city-owned buildings. And the error is ours for, for doing it in the first place. So I don't disagree with you that it's not comfortable to go back and, and change things, but we've got to make it right. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor <laughs> Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I think, Councillor, to just talk about the history of here a little bit. When we first redeveloped Sharawi House, we went and we hired a consultant to come and give us ideas for it. We did our diligence around that. The best idea they came up with was the restaurant idea. We went out there and said, who's interested? This was the key person, and it was a very small field of interested people, and this was the person. The um, Council did invest quite a bit of funding in that facility to fix it up, thanks to a grant, but still a fairly substantial investment. So I think we want to see that business succeed. And 7.7 percent, you know, maybe if you say it fast, doesn't sound that loud or sound that much. But what if next year is another 7.7 percent? That means you add next year, you would add this year's increase plus next year's. So by next year, they could be facing a 15 point something percent increase to base rent and then that becomes tags on to the next year after that so by the life of this agreement if inflation stays high the city itself could have presented a very substantial impediment to this business trying to be successful just by those cost increases and and i agree with the comment made by councillor elliott I, I think that we should really look at any of the leases we have that are strictly tied to um cpi because I, I, it's you know it used to be a very consistent number but it's shown just tonight, lots by the amount of discussion, that it's really faulty to tie to that and expect expect it to be a commercially acceptable. Okay, thank you, Mr. City Manager. Any further discussion? We do. Oh, Councillor Rudenberg. Thank you. So great discussion. Um, I come back to the the piece in the report that talks about the community charter that says council uh, must not provide a grant, benefit, advantage, or any other form of assistance to a business which limits the degree to which the city can provide accommodation. So are we doing that by changing our our from the CPI to the two percent? Are we now breaking the community charter? That's what, that would be the only thing I would be concerned about here. Yeah, city manager. In, um, the director of uh, finances may disagree with this, but uh, my conclusion is given that we're coming to, if we may just change what's being proposed, we're bringing it back to be more in line with other rents that we charge in commercial agreements. I don't think that is providing a subsidy. I think that's an adjustment to maybe a faulty contract. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. Are we ready for, we have a mover, we have a seconder, and it's on the, rec, it's on the recommendation undisturbed. Uh, so no more further discussion. I'll call the question. All in favor? Opposed? One opposed? Do you wish that vote recorded? Not important? Okay, thank you. We'll move on to the next item of business. And... This is for the Director of Community Services, the Curling Center Agreement. This is agreement night. Yes, <laughs> that's very true. Uh, the purpose of this report is to obtain council approval to renew the lease agreement with the Quinnell Curling Club for the property on which the curling center is located. Uh, the curling club provides recreational curling programs from the curling center that benefit the community at large. Uh, the curling center building is owned by the Quinnell Curling Club, a not-for-profit organization, but is located on city-owned property. The Quinnell Curling Club has held a lease for the property for decades. Uh, the term of the most recent agreement has expired, uh, but has been renewed on a month-to-month -month basis until a new agreement is in place. Uh, the terms of the proposed
proposed agreement are the same as the previous agreement with no changes other than the term dates. Under the terms of the proposed agreement, the Curling Club will provide an annual payment to the City of $1,000. The recommendation is that Council enter into the attached five-year lease agreement with the Quinnell Curling Club for the use of lands owned by the City of Quinnell located at Lot 5, Block 40, Town of Quinnell Plan 17,000, and a Parcel B. Plan B7204 of Block 79, Town of Quinnell, Plan 17,000, and that the Mayor and Corporate Administrator be authorized to execute such documentation as required to complete the lease agreement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Norburn. Uh, any uh, motion coming out of that uh, regarding the recommendation, or are we having discussion? This is what's I'll move as the recommendation. Uh, thank you, Councillor Goulet. Goulet is, uh, Councillor Goulet is um, moving the recommendation, seconded by Councillor Rudenberg. Any discussion? I'll call the question. All in favor? Opposed? Oh, wonderful. Carried. Thank you. The next uh, item is uh, back to the Director of Development Services, and this is res with respect to a cat, uh, strata conversion application at 410 Pinchbeck. Thank you, uh, Mayor, and I'm going to go right into the background and give you a bit of a longer uh, uh, report on some of the background here. We haven't even looked at a strata conversion since 2007, so that's why I'm going to do that, just to give some history here. The strata conversion policy was developed in 2007 in response to an application for strata conversion of two apartments uh, in, in the city. Um, the application, um, uh, strata conversions are an, applica an application to deposit a strata plan for a pre previously occupied unstratified building. The Strata Property Act requires approval of the approving authority, which is Municipal Council. The Act requir requires Council to consider very specific things. They include the priority of rental accommodation over privately owned housing in the area, any proposals for relocations of persons occupying a residential building, the life expectancy of the building, projected major increases in maintenance costs due to the condition of the building, and any other matters in its opinion um, it feels are relevant. The strata conversion policy was amended just recently, in August, to allow staff to consider applications where the policy of having a vacancy rate study showing a rate at or above 4% cannot be met. If determined that other community interests are met by the strata conversion. The applicant recognizes that the vacancy rate is is lower is not lower than or sorry is lower than 4% but requests consideration due to inflation elevating costs well in excess of permitted rent increases due to limits in the landlord tenancy act due to long term rent tenancy rental rates that are significantly below market at this specific um, building, inability to continue to maintain building uh, uh, to accommodate the standard due to the uh, revenues, and the intention not to displace tenants and work along with tenants to purchase the units. It's important for me to uh, note that this report and this discussion tonight is only to give staff approval to proceed along with the application. It is not the full approval of the strata conversion. There is a number of steps under next steps that are listed here that will then need to come next um, to fulfill the remainder of the strata conversion policy. It includes following council's endorsement to proceed, uh, 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 or sorry, following your endorsement tonight to proceed, uh, the, the applicant will still need to come back to council for final decision. And they will need to provide the following. Uh, they will need to have, have a notarized statement declaring that each person occupying the building has been provided written notice of the intent to convert the building into strata lots under the Strata Property Act and the date of which the matter is being presented to council. So when it comes back to council, members of this building will be able to be notified and be here to present to council. The number of units occupied on the date of the notice, 
that the notices have been posted in conspicuous places in the building, adv advising of the intent to convert the building up to strata for a minimum of three weeks prior to council consideration. Reason why that's in there is because there's often very large buildings that's also um, that are being um, converted, and so that you want to have additional notices just in case there's other people living there that you, even the built the owner may not be aware of. Um, that's the intent of that um, uh, provision. Um, we will work with the owner to make sure that there is, if there's any sort of mailbox area, etc., that they can also be posted there. Um, that each person occupying a unit in the building has been provided with prospective sale prices, example of management fees, and a copy of the decla declaration of building quality. That units for conversion of four and under dwellings must provide confirmation that of 75% of tenants approve the conversion. Of course, this is the case is that we, this is above five units and therefore the uh, applicant under the policy currently is that they must provide uh, confirmation that 50% of the tenants approve the conversion. Council's approval will be also subject to meeting several conditions outlined in Section 5 of the strata conversion policy, uh, which will be if strata council does approve. Um, in fact, there's a few things that will need to happen prior because they're required that the, the occupants would have some of this information prior to making their decisions. Um, that they will have to have the following. A building report prepared by a professional engineer or architect that provides BC code review and that specifically certifies the following, that the building is reasonably of uh, reasonable quality, its age, physical condition, and state of repair of each building, including heating, plumbing, electrical, electrical fixtures, and equipment, elevators, roof drainage, and foundation, as well as general workmanship and measure of compliance with relevant bylaws and the National Building Code the life expectancy of the building, a final financial statement including the projected increase in maintenance costs, and proof of potable water and means of sewage, if not on certain services, of course this is. Um, the reasons for those last policies, of course, is to protect any potential uh, tenant that may be, or any individual that may be purchasing one of the units. Uh, I'm going to ask for Council's questions at this point before going to the recommendation. Uh, thank you. I'm going to go to Councillor Runge. It's it's unfortunate that we're actually coming to this stage, and I, you know, if, if we go to what the what the uh, what was asked by for by um, by the owner of the building, because rental increases over the past ten years have what equaled out one point five percent. We've had arguments around the table about all sorts of CPI stuff that is way over this. This building is old is older but because the the tenants have been there for quite some time so he must he's had great tenants which is great but would with that section on page 99 of 173 number five because we're following the new building code would that kind of uh, like I'd be worried if this was my building and it was built in 1985 and I had to meet today's building code standards uh, how would I do that without tearing the building down that's not a requirement here. But it says repair of each building, heating, plumbing, electric fi fixtures, and that they're, sorry, I missed on the, and they're relevant with bylaws and the National Building Code, which would be the current one, wouldn't it, or would we go back to the? National Building Code, it's a National Building Code. It's, it's, it's broader and bigger or larger than, than the Provincial Building Code, but still it's going to be, um, uh, the, 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 the aspects of it will be that it has to be the code, uh, that nothing that has to be run, it doesn't have to be brought up to the new standard. There's certain items that will have to be um, looked at for, from a perspective of making them individual units. Um, so like uh, when, when it was developed, um, did it have the proper fire separations in between for them to be individual units versus versus apartment units. There's just some differences in, in, in code requirements for making them strata units versus, versus um, and that would have to probably be to code, but that's, it's so doable. Guess, just as a clarification then, so my question then would be, if I had a sixplex that was built in 1985 that I was renting out, I wasn't able to increase the rent, I was in now un unable to maintain at the standard I want to maintain, now I want to stratify, would have those buildings at that time had those fire separations already in there? Not, there's always fire separations, uh, so I don't want to hear you, but, but they're, they're, they're to a different, they could be to a different standard. So would they be required to be brought up to today's standard? 
they're required to be developed to be um, between uh, separate uh, legal entities versus uh, separate apartment units. Um, there, there's a whole different, and I'm not going to get into it because I'm not the engineer. That's what we require an engineer's but, but report. It, but I guess my question is, would it cause this process not to go forward based on that? We have stratified two apartment buildings before, as I stated. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Mr. Parsons, uh, I, I recognize that you're in the, the audience, and uh, I, I would like you to, not, not at this moment, but to come forward and answer any questions, uh, but I'd like, to, I'd like you to hear the council dis discussion before we move to that point. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? I have a question, and that is, and it, and it goes to this building report requirement. Does the fact that this particular piece of property is within the West Quinnell land st stability area, does that, is there any effect there? Thank you, and, and uh, again, the previous two buildings were also in the land stability um, area, and no, it doesn't have a direct effect, but we do require, um, once we do the process, that a covenant be placed on the uh, property, noting that it is in the West Quinnell land stability area, just as we do with any other kind of builds like this. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Elliott. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Mayor. So we've asked a couple of questions about the building itself. I'm curious, um, the letter that we have in here was dated September 28th. So I'm curious if you have any information about um, the residents being um, asked about or told about this. Are they aware? Thank you, and we can let uh, Mr. Parsons speak further to this, but uh, he has informed me that he has been in discussions with all his residents, and he can provide some additional detail on that. Okay, so I would like some additional yeah, detail. Yeah, so I, I could, I'd like to call Mr. Parsons forward uh, to the microphone. Just press the, uh, the button, and when the uh, microphone lights up, and just for the record, uh, I don't think it matters which one, does it? Uh, pick, pick a color. And um, just give your uh, your name and your where you, where you live because that's for the record. Greetings. Microphone. Greetings. Uh, could you speak into the mic? You got to press the button until it turns red. There you go. We're just uh, get a little closer to the microphone. It's not I, We did get that. Okay. So that that's Got it. better. So did you want to ask us or do we? How, well, I, 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 uh, I'd like to respond. Councilor Elliott first. Sure. Yeah, we'll go with that. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm curious if the residents have been notified of this situation. Yes. Uh, my wife and I met with all the residents. We spent about an hour with each of them. And um, for the record, this is like family. I take care of these people. I'm an incredible landlord. These are very good people. I've met with them all. And none of them necessarily want me to go forward with this because they pay rents. Uh, these, are, these are beautiful ta townhomes, 2,200, 2,100 square feet. And they pay from 750 to $900 rent and they've been there most of them as long as we've owned the building which is 10 years so I explained to them I can't keep the building anymore I can't afford to put new fridges in it stoves I I, I, I supplemented the $30,000 roof I just put on it I paid for that because the building didn't have the funds to do it so they all understood they all recognized and I went back um, after recognizing that I needed to get uh, fifty percent of these people to agree in writing uh, that they would be okay with this. The first five I phoned agreed, and I suspect they'll all agree. And there's a few people there. Um, there's, we got two widows. I'll be taking care of them. They won't be kicked out on the street. Uh, there's a few units. Um, probably half the units will be sold to tenants. And one unit, we have the fellow who's moving out. And one unit I hold for the hospital. Uh, I give them a discounted rate for their nurses. So we keep that building for them. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Carry on. So to be clear, and thank you for that, I'm glad that they've all been notified. 
first, I'm sorry, but first you said that none of them were in favor of this, no, and then after no, the conversation, they... well, you know, when I, I I didn't put any pressure on them. I told them what I was doing, and well, they didn't like the idea because they like paying seven hundred dollars or eight hundred dollars rent, and this is going to change. Um, I the building cannot go on. I don't have the funds. I, I mean, it cannot go on. Um, I presented uh, Tanya with documents, quite substantial documents. I went to all my suppliers, and I said over the last 10 years, what's been your increase, what's been my increase? And it averaged from about 50 to 250% my costs. That's how much it's gone up in 10, in 10 years. And I provided a document, uh, a financial document, showing my increase is 13.2% in the 10 years. So there's a huge problem there. I mean, it wasn't too bad when I bought the place, but after 10 years, my costs are just way, way too high. Um, I okay, just can't Just do for that. clarity, we, we do have those documents. We've oh, seen them good, all. We, good. So thank you for, for putting good. those in. You betcha. But I'm still a little bit confused because you said okay. that there's eight units. Yes. But there's two um, widows yes. that you will not do this increase on. So now no, we're no, about I'm going through the whole process. I'm straddling the building, but they can. I'll own them. They can just continue to pay me rent. I will. I won't sell those units. I mean, the idea is to strata to recover some money so that I can reinvest back in this building. And uh, some of the tenants, I'm not sure how many yet, probably three or four, are going to buy the units. They want to buy the units. I've also provided mortgage information for them. They didn't realize prior to now that it would, it's often cheaper to buy a property than to rent a property. And, um, but it seems to be the way in Quinnell, people like to rent. So I have two widows that I'm going to retain ownership of the strata. They can stay there. Um, I've got probably four that will buy. And I've got one that's leaving, he needs a bigger place. And I have one I'm not sure of. Um, she's a student, uh, she has the lowest rent, it's just over $700, she's lived there for a very, very long time. She has a lot of family members living with her. Um, I'm not sure what I'm gonna do with that one, but I think I've been reasonable uh, looking at all the rest of the tenants. Okay, well you do sound like a nice landlord. My, I'm just concerned about anybody being displaced and not having a home. Well, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I, nobody's gonna get kicked out on the street. I don't know how I'll do it. I've even offered to help them financially with their down payment if they can buy it, you know, so that, you know, to make it work for them. I, I'm, I'm not a brutal guy, I, I got a big heart. I will make this work. Uh, are you, uh, you're good to go? Okay, anyone else? Uh, Councillor Rudenberg. You were asked, oh, I'm sorry, may I speak or no? I, I'm no. asking Councillor oh. Rudenberg to ask you a question. Oh, I see. So, thank you. Um, you, you sound like a very kind gentleman. You know, you Thank talk you. about the two two um, residents that you won't turn into that strata. So does this meet your needs by by being so kind? Um, I could do a lot better if I could strata and sell them all. My realtor's already told me I'll do a lot better, but I'm not going to do that. Okay, because my concern is that you do this and then you still don't get what you need to, to keep the building moving forward. I just need to sell one unit. They're worth a quarter of a million dollars each. And I'm 65, so, and I don't spend a lot of money. And I've got, I got some um, of my own um, um, income uh, other than this, not a lot of pensions, but uh, it's just the, the building isn't paying for itself anymore. It's just not there. So so by selling one, two, or even three of the units, this will, uh, that's a lot of money. And I'm really good with money. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. C Councillor Runge. 
So I'm going to have a question, so you can ask me questions if you want. Okay, now, my, my background is I built strip mall shopping centers and high-rises for 40 years. So I'm well under, well aware of financial, or financial of uh, fire separation. So I met with your chief building inspector, and he's told, my building is in 97, he's told me there's been no changes in fire separations since 97, and that building will have everything in it. So I hired an engineer. We've already gone through the building. There's a few issues that he's recommended upgrading. Um, we're still working on that. And the fire separations, they're perfect, but he's going to have me redo some of the caulking. It's dated and uh, bring it up to date. So that's being done right now. Well, that's good to hear because the other option would have been, you know, if, if this strata hadn't worked and because this is, like like I keep saying at, at uh, some other meetings, this is a direct correlation, an unintended consequence of protecting our society from rent increases during COVID uh, yeah. fr by our provincial government. So the other option, if this didn't, wouldn't go forward, would be to sell the building, right? And then a new landlord could change it the rents. Well, no, the new landlord can't change the rents. The rents are stable. The only way the rents can change is if I move my family in there. If I move my son, my other son, my sister, my brother-in-law, I could move them all in. I, I had a very lengthy conversation with Landlord and Tenant Act. I'm very familiar with the act. And, uh, you know, I was not impressed. I was not impressed with these people. I told them, I, you know, I just need to find a way to raise the rent. I don't... I don't you know, you have a lady that worked here. Her name was Anna Rankin. Uh, I worked with Anna Rankin because I've, I've, I've been looking at properties up here for development. And uh, I was involved with her. And then your two top realtors, I've had meetings with both of them in town. And I said, what are the rents of these places? It's Fifteen to 1700 is is the rent. And I don't know if you see a picture of this place, but these, these are really nice units. And I would have been willing to accept... You know, uh, 1300 1350 um, but and it's interesting they, they don't want to do that but they'll let me go through this whole process and end up some of them paying that anyway so um, yeah it's um it's it's a tough it's a tough position you know I tried I hung on as long as I could I kept this building until it was it, it just it died. You know, I can't put money back into it anymore. So um, this is my only option, and uh, and I'm very creative. Um, I'm, a, uh, I'm I'm a tradesman. Uh, I owned a construction two construction companies for years. Project management company. I'm well connected. I can get things done. I can get things done quite cheaply too. I know how to do it. So, um, but I need some cash flow now, and this is the only way it's going to happen. Okay, I just want to remind council that this is that the voting on the rec recommendation doesn't seal the deal. I mean, there's a lot of hoops that, um, yes. that you're going to have to jump through, and this this really isn't much different than going to first reading on a bylaw. We're not making the final decision until we do final uh, yes. adoption, and uh, so I just encourage council to think along that line. Do I have a mover and seconder on the on the recommendation? Uh, I'm, I'm going to go to, uh, you're moving Councillor Rudenberg, seconding uh, Councillor uh, Runge. Any further dis discussion? Councillor Elliott. Uh, thank you. And just one, one last question. I'm curious, if this, if this, if you've talked to everybody, why isn't anybody here? Like, if this was the potential for my house, <laughs> I don't think these people have an interest Can, uh, well, in being here. This would intimidate them, I would think. Are you talking about my tenants? Oh, they're yes, sir. All, they're all aware I'm here tonight, if that's what you're asking. No, no, right. no, no. I get that. I'm just, if, it, if this was concerning my home and the possibility of me owning it or not, or being out on the street, I might be here. Yeah. Um, point of order. I'm, I'm sorry, Councillor, but that's not a fair question. To, this I just thought public, he might know. I know. It's just, it's not a public hearing, so I don't think it's a fair question to ask why his tenants aren't here supporting. I thought he might know. Okay. okay we're going to move along, and I've got uh, uh, Councillor, Councillor, uh, Director Turner next. Thank you. I just want, and I just want to clarify the point, uh, Councillor Elliott. So, um, this, the process, as, 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 as I've shown you in the report, they have the opportunity to come to the next council meeting. Um, we've told them, I, or I assume they've, yes. they, we've, they've been told through my discussions with uh, Mr. Parsons, um, that we will, they will be notified and given an opportunity to be here, directly notified. 
about the opportunity to speak here. And so the process probably, they've probably been informed that this is not the time, but the, the next time is. Okay, thank you. So I have a mover and a seconder on the recommendation undisturbed. Uh, so now I will call for the question. All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous, thank you. Thank you very well kindly. You're a, you're a very compassionate landlord, and I'm a landlord myself, and I yeah. hope that I learned some lessons from you. May I have a comment? One more uh, comment? Yes, but make it quick, because okay. we've got a lot the, of business. The second part we're going through, I have qualified uh, consultants, everything. It's all, I've, I've got it all done. It will all fall into place. I've, uh, I've got no hiccups that I've seen, so I feel good about it. Thank you very much, and, and good luck. Uh, okay, so... The next one is um, the, I know we, we've got, I think we've got another agreement coming up. Yes, I'm happy to report that we have another agreement. This is Administrator, Administration Report 17-23, Quinnell Crafters Society, Director Norburn to report. Okay, thank you. Uh, the purpose of this report is to obtain council approval to renew the lease agreement with the Quinnell Crafters Society uh, for the use of the Hudson's Bay building. Uh, the Quinnell Crafters Society, a not-for-profit organization, has had a lease to operate the gift shop at the Hudson's Bay building for a number of years. The most recent agreement expired June 30th, 2021, and has been renewed on a month-to-month -month basis while terms of a new agreement are negotiated. Uh, the rent charged to the society has been adjusted on multiple occasions by Council as the society has struggled financially. Uh, most recently at its September 29th, 2020 meeting, Council passed a resolution to forgive rent for the Quinnell Crafters Society from April 2020 to September 2020 due to the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic and to pay the property taxes for the building, something that the society was previously responsible for. The society currently pays $665 a month in rent, uh, $7,980 a year, which is higher than their previous rent, but now the city covers the cost of the property taxes, so their net payment is, is less. Uh, property taxes for the building in 2022 were $4,534.28, which is an increase of nearly $1,000 since 2020. Uh, the proposed agreement is substantially similar similar to the previous agreement, except that it stipulates that the society is not responsible for property taxes. The agreement is based on a 2% increase to the $665 month uh, rent that the society has been paying since 2020, with a fixed rate for the duration of the agreement. Under the terms of the agreement, the society is responsible for all utilities and regular maintenance of the building. The city is not responsible for the majority of operating expenses related uh, to the building. Um, and the recommendation is that Council enter into the attached five-year agreement with the Quinnell Crafters Society for the use of the Hudson's Bay Building and that the Mayor and Corporate Administrator be author authorized to execute such documentation as required to complete the agreement. Thank you, Mr. Norburn. Uh, just a, a, a little typo that I see in there on page uh, 111 of 137. Uh, you say that you have attached the curling club lease, but uh, you know, I've got to catch these things. And uh, it's all in good spirit. Uh, so do I have a mover or a discussion on the recommendation? Sure. Okay, Councillor Run, are you moving? No, I want to discuss. Oh, you're first. discussing, okay. I'd like to stay till about 11 or 12. <laughs> Is it OT for you guys? Uh, <laughs> just a question with regards to previous taxes. How significantly different is this 665 to previous amounts that they paid before? Like, was there an amount before $300 plus taxes, or was it $500 plus taxes, or what was it? I'm just going on memory, and I did have it, and I didn't bring it here, but I think it was in the range of like $460 a month for their rent, and then they paid their taxes. So they were providing us with $665. That's where that number came from. And at one time, that covered their rent plus their taxes, but then as taxes increased, uh, it didn't cover it anymore, and we went back to them and said, you're going to need to pay a little bit more, and they said, help, we can't. And uh, that's when a report was brought to council and council uh, you know took the action that they did no I remember the report with regard in COVID there so 
So roughly, was that 665 back to the, would that have been equal to their rent plus their taxes previously? Is that what you were thinking? At one time, it certainly was, yeah. Okay. So that's what that, that's, well, that's what the pattern was, Thank was you. they were paying both their rent and taxes in the form of monthly payments. Thank you. Okay, do I, sorry, do I have a motion on the recommendation uh, moving uh, Councillor McKelvey, seconding Councillor Vick? Any further discussion? I'll call for the vote. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Thank you, Council. And I think that is it for the um, for the crowd or for the all of the agreements tonight. I don't think we've got any agreements left. Uh, so now we'll move to the late item, which is a, admin report 18 slash 23 snow contractors liability insurance. Director Bolton, please. Yeah, so as council may recall at the last council meeting, we approved two snow contractors being added to our liability insurance. We had one of other of our snow contractors come forward who thought he had the appropriate insurance, but then realized he didn't and also asked to be included on ours. So this is just a motion that council approves the service provider agreement between City of Cornell and Kodiak Mechanical with the date as set out in the service provider agreement. That's moved by uh, Councillor Elliott, seconded by Councillor... Uh, <laughs> Councillor Ruth getting late. Uh, Rudenberg. Yeah, big R there. That stands for Ron. Um, okay. Uh, any further? Oh, Councillor Runge. Yes, another there are R. questions. I, I think I said this last year when we came, oh, came across with this. And I, I would like to propose that the contractors pay their insurance. E well, maybe you can say why they're not. Well, I was just going to say, like, th these guys are looking at insurance in the range of 40 to 50 grand a year. They just can't pay it. It's in order to go on roads. That's the challenge. No, no, I'm, yeah. I'm perfectly fine with that. Yeah. But what I would love to see is that we do not subsidize what we have to pay for their insurance. They can pay, if they have to pay 40000 to be on the road, why can't they pay the 2000 to have insurance for their vehicle? And actually, added on to that, what I'd like to see it going forward is that we create some sort of a co-op type program where they drop money into that 10,000 deduction that if something were to happen that deduction would be paid for by the contractors who are using that service. We shouldn't have the taxpayers well, I, mean, I guess we're having them pay for snow anyway, but I don't, I don't think we should be paying for their insurance. I think insurance in a person's business should be covered fully by them. We're already subsidizing it to the tune of $38,000. Okay, thank you, Councillor Runge. Uh, I'm going to go to Director Bolton. Yeah, I will note that to, to ask them to pay the full 2000 I'll discuss that with the Director of Public Works so that we can give them a heads up on that next year and see what their concerns are. Of course, the deductible only happens if there's an incident. And I think the other, I think they'd want the person responsible. You know, it becomes tough, right? But we actually have to sign with our agreement with MIABC that the city is covering the deductible. So I would have to have a discussion with them of whether there were other options. Yeah, and what I would be thinking of is that and it would just sit in, a, in, a, in an account, right? So they, if we have five people using this account for one year or two years, they put, you know, they put 500 bucks in every year, and that account slowly builds up to the 10,000. So if something were to happen, of course we hope it never does, that that would be used from their account as a collective. Yeah, I'll discuss options with MIBC. Okay. Uh, but to just a point to that, because this was the exact discussion we had last year, and it was we were going to discuss that 50% last year, I believe, too. Okay, can we, can we move on? That sounds like that, that's good um, subject matter for FSAC sometime. Duly noted, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. All right, it's, uh, the time is uh, moving along here. We have a motion on the floor. Any further discussion? I'll call the question. All in favor? Opposed? One opposed. The motion carries. Thank you. Okay, we don't have any more business. Uh, oh, council information packages. And I don't see that anyone has asked for anything to come forward. We're thankful for that. Uh, now we move to, we don't have any correspondence now. Moving to bylaws. Bylaw 1929, City of Quinnell, Comprehensive Fees and Charges. Bylaw number 1929 of 19, or pardon me, 2022. Final adoption, please. Councillor Elliott, Councillor Vick, discussion. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. 
Uh, no new business. Um, now I move to, um, no, there's no changes to upcoming meeting schedule. There's no changes to committee appointments. Um, no, oh, I have an announcement for a future event, and that is to remind all of council that uh, we've been challenged to enter the reverse advent calendar food health household drive. The deadline is December 10, and if you want more information, I would be happy to provide. Gallery questions. RJ, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so I don't have any gallery questions, um, so now I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. Moved by Councillor uh, Councillor McKelvey, seconded by Councillor Runge. I'm sure there's no discussion on this one, so all in favor carried. Thank you, Council.